Okay, uh, welcome everybody to our poultry litter quality webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Um, why are we talking about litter? Uh, we're talking about litter because it's a big deal. So um, litter can impact on the health of our birds and the health of our staff. And it's also a very important byproduct of our operations. So um, it's, it's uh, something that we need to, to try and focus on. And uh, it's not always easy to manage and a lot can go wrong. So we have four expert speakers with us today. Um, and each one of them is going to talk about litter from a different perspective. And um, also, I might mention these presentations you're going to hear and see today are world-class standard presentations. So they are presentations that uh, you would see at a lot of uh, poultry conferences overseas or, uh, or locally as well in their content and, um, and the speakers themselves. And this is a great way, I think, of us being able to share this knowledge um, with you guys at the moment where uh, you don't have to leave your home or your office and um, and that way we can share knowledge. I know a lot of you guys, even when COVID is not on, can't always get to conferences um, overseas or even locally So because you're busy running your businesses. So um, I'm really glad that we're able to share this information with you and uh, share this knowledge through our speakers today. And also we're going to be uh, raising some money for the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. Um, a lot of charities this year have been hit hard in, in their fundraising activities due to um, social events not happening. So um, to try and help out in that regard, as we would normally do at the Poultry Golf Day, EW Nutrition is proudly going to donate $50 per attendee at this webinar, which will go to help, help uh, the people who are suffering from prostate cancer and their families as well. So uh, yeah, with the wine and the nibbles, um, enjoy those. Um, we thought being a three hour webinar, it's a bit of a long one. So we wanted to provide some sustenance uh, for all of us to get through. So enjoy. And um, what we will do is uh, just trying to change slide here. One minute. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I knew something would happen and it did straight away. So, sorry. Um, yeah, so what we're going to do is have a quick um, company presentation on EW Nutrition. Just a brief one, which will be given by Yurik Grappenton. Yurik is our regional director for Southeast Asia Pacific for EW Nutrition. And uh, also Yurik uh, recently became a father. He had a baby boy born back in May. And so uh, he's got some, uh, he's gonna show us some dad jokes along the way as well. Um, and uh, then we will get into the speakers. So we'll have two presentations, uh, each being 30 minutes long. And then we'll have a 15 minute break and uh, then we'll have the next two presentations also being 30 minutes long each. And then we'll have our Q&A session. So the way to ask questions is to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, as we can't see you guys or hear you. So that's the only way to ask questions is by clicking on that Q&A button and typing in your question. And we will then, um, the speakers will be answering the questions at the end live. Um, and uh, also, after each presentation, if the speaker finishes a little bit early, we might have time for one or two quick questions. Otherwise, we'll keep moving on and we will then definitely uh, tackle those questions at the Q&A session at the end. So, and then at the very end, we'll have a, a quick poll, which is only take 30 seconds to complete or less. Um, if you could please uh, do that uh, for us, that'll help give us some feedback for our, for our future webinars. So we'll, we'll move along now. I'll, I'll ask uh, Yurik, to, to join us and to um, take over and start giving the company presentation. Thanks, Yurik, welcome. Thanks, David, um, and good afternoon to New Zealand. Good afternoon to Australia. Um, thanks for the short introduction, David. And I um, uh, yeah, want to really express my gratitude for you joining our uh, webinar today and uh, express as well a warm welcome 
for this poultry litter quality webinar. I will briefly go through our company presentation for whom you have uh, not heard about us too much. So our slogan is functional innovations backed by science. So we want to be innovative, but we really want to back our innovations on science. Next. Sorry for that. Sharing seems not to work as it should. All right, thanks, David. So what are the critical industry challenges? What are the challenges of uh, your businesses? So we believe that um, the health and welfare of animal and human is, is critical important because we are what we eat. The health of humans is directly affected by the health of animals. EW Nutrition acts as a promoter of holistic programs with science-based solutions for animal production. Lowering antibiotic use. In April 2019, the Secretary General of the United Nations published a new report called No Time to Wait, warning of 10 million human deaths per year by 2050 and recommending safe and effective alternatives to antibiotics for humans, animals, and plants. This is what we have been working towards. Continuous business profitability. There is no trade off between good practices and business profitability. We believe you can have both. We help deliver stable year-over-year -year revenue from reliable flock and herds and increase production efficiency. Harmful substance reductions. We promote safe and integrated feed practices, focusing on reducing the levels of residues and meat, water, and soil through programs and services. And last but not least, production efficiency. Our programs help improve production efficiency by delivering higher availability, reduced year-over-year -year variation, increased body weight gain, and the feed cost reduction factor. Next. What is our purpose? Why do we exist as a company? We want to mitigate the impact of antimicrobial resistance by providing comprehensive animal nutrition solutions. That is our mission, and it's a very personal mission for me as well. David mentioned it. I'm a young father five months yesterday, and it's of critical importance for me. If my baby boy is getting sick and is getting an infection, I want to be 100% sure that it's not a resistant bacteria which is causing the uh, infection and that he cannot be treated by antibiotics. And therefore, we need to do everything what we can do to protect ourselves of uh, resistant bacteria. Thank you. Next. What are our core values? Customer first. If we cannot link what we do to the customer, it's useless. We respect those we do business with. Their business interests and considerations come first. We take time to learn about customer specifics and we ded dedicate time to develop customer specific solutions. Acting respectfully, communicating constructively through an environment, customers, distributors, governments. So everything we do at work and outside speaks about us and our values. We act to make our customers' business better. We act to make our own business better. But we also act and to make the world a better place. Seek excellence. Striving to become the best through continuous improvement. We are today one of the top five feed additive companies investing in R&D. We invest as well in training our people. And we make decisions on the basis of first, second, and third order consequences, not just immediate consequences. And we hold ourselves and others accountable. Being curious, two dimensions, through R&D and yourself asking questions to customers. We do not take anything for granted. We conduct continuous, continuous research for constantly improve our solution to our customers and our industry challenges. We look for better solutions to challenge inside our organization, and we encourage questions to understand our partners. Next. 
We are a member of a family of leading agribusinesses. It's a big company group with around 14,000 employees and a business of 2.5 billion euros in revenues. We, uh, Sita Nutrition, we are in the animal nutrition uh, business on the top left. On the top right, Animal Health. Um, Vaxinova, one of our sister companies, has been expanding the vaccine business through a strong commitment to R&D, accompanied by successful M&As. Recently, for example, we acquired the leading South American vaccine company BioVet in Brazil and Epitopics in the United States. Animal breeding companies um, in the fields of broiler, layer, turkey, but as well in aqua, salmon, trout, and tilapia breeding. All companies in breeding, animal health, as well as animal nutrition are global companies, while the food production businesses are traditional, more local, and regional. For example, Pilsland being one of the leading mushroom producers in Germany. All companies are acting as independent entities in the market to ensure that each company leverage their own resources for the maximum benefit for the customer. What is our commercial footprint within a global reach? We have currently around 25 countries covered with our own technical and sales people to be close to our customers. So we are very near to you with technical as well as commercial resources. We today deliver comprehensive solutions in six countries, continents and growing across all of them. We have seven offices around the world, enabling us to quickly reach you where you ever are, wherever you are. And our worldwide presence facilitates local knowledge for better localized solutions. What is our production footprint to be close to you, to our key accounts? What is that differentiating us from the competition? We want to be as close to our customers, not only with our own personal, but as well with our production units, to be more agile in developing and delivering timely solutions, to be more cost-effective for you, and as well delivering customized solution, which is in general our differentiation factor compared to our competition. We currently run six production units in Germany, Brazil, United States, Japan, and China. And most of our competitors only have one or two units. So EW Nutrition, strong commitment to R&D is our base for success in the future. We have around uh, six R&D centers in uh, Brazil, United States, Japan, and China. And I want to highlight especially our German laboratory in Cologne, where we can, for example, screen around 120,000 alternatives of functional proteins at the same time through a high-tech three-level robotic system, which is state-of-the-art and not being seen in many of our uh, competition. We as well have a scale-up center in Leuner in Germany, where we can produce from lab size up to a 70,000 liter fermenter to scale up the production of fermentation processes. Then one of our core beliefs is seeking as well for the excellence to become the best. We don't want to become the biggest, but the best in our industry. Today, we already employ around 400 employees with over 30 nationalities with an EW nutrition. We are diverse in personal and cultural background, but serving the same mission. Driven by our core beliefs, our diversity makes us agile and helps us to better understand the locality and specificity of our customer needs. And this is the point where I hand over back to David. Thank you very much. Well, okay, it's still my part. So I want to introduce uh, the hamper set, uh, which David mentioned uh, before, uh, that you can enjoy in Australia. Unfortunately, I'm here uh, in Singapore, uh, stuck at 10 o'clock uh, with my coffee, mark, which is as well quite nice, but not as nice as this. So in the hamper set, we start with a wine. We have a Cabernet Merlot, 
which is a classic blend, beautiful balance, hopefully with rich, deep fruit sweetness, fine tannins, which is already selling for 12 years. And I want to quote a very famous person, Alexander Fleming. Penicillin cures, but wine makes people happy. And hopefully that is true for today as well. Enjoy the technical presentations now. Thank you, Yurik. Um, so our first speaker for today is Nalini Chinivasagam. Nalini is a principal research scientist at the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, Queensland. So Nalini, I'll just stop sharing now and then you'll be able to share your screen. There, and if you just make sure you're, yes. I think you have to go uh, into, into the slideshow by clicking uh, escape or clicking there to exit. Exit, okay. I share the screen. So that's me. So please, please um, click escape on your keyboard or click here in the. Okay. So. Okay, and then I'm on my first slide. Yeah, good. Okay. okay. Perfect. That's great. Okay. I'm just putting my timer on. Okay. okay, I'd first like to uh, thank th for the opportunity to present today and to be a part of this important uh, webinar on literary use. So the title of my presentation today is Literary Use, a Research-Driven Perspective on Food Safety Issues. So a brief background, literary use was already occurring in, in Queensland for around 20 years at the time our research co commenced. But there were common concerns and perceptions, and one of them being the movement of key food safety pathogens across sequential farming cycles. This was recognized by the industry at the time, leading to the need for a science-based understanding of literary use in farming, which was also backed by Australian data to be of relevance. And thus commenced a decade of research from 2004 to 2015. There was no prior Australian on-farm quantitative data to help address risks and manage. So our research was not about changing how industry operated, but to provide the science to facilitate industry-driven management based on their long experience on already adopted practices. So naturally the studies were driven by industry. Our research was carried out on farm with industry collaboration to derive relevant practical outcomes. Our studies address both food safety and the environmental concerns driven by food safety. And what I mean that is I'll illustrate in this slide. Now there are potential pathways to pathogen transfer to the human food chain. Two and three are largely indirect and environmental, two being the tunnel ventilated sheds, three being as a consequence of litter in the environment via soil crop or water, or the shed directly uh, in terms of litter. We, we carried out reuse farms or involved across studies one, two, and three. Now to the projects. The first one was assessment for the safe and sustainable utilization of spent litter from meat chicken sheds. We had a small role here, but no doubt this study paved the way for the future work that we carried out. The second was evaluating risks posed by pathogens and dust emissions from meat chicken sheds, reuse of chicken litter across broiler cycles, managing the foodborne pathogen risks. The fourth was evaluating foodborne pathogen transfer associated with partial and full reuse litter. And the fifth was Kampala back to dynamics in free, free range and conventional farming systems. Now, my talk today 
I have over 10 years of research to summarize in 30 minutes. So I will provide a brief background to each project, how or what was done, and provide some key messages for each study. I'll show you a range of slides, mainly to have a feel of what was done, and you could get further details from what I have listed. I have also written this as a research summary in 2019 titled On-Farm Food Safety, Assisting Industry to Produce Safe Food in a Sustainable Manner, where there would be more information. <clears throat> and you could also get further information from some of the final reports that are available. And some work is published via peer review and others are currently in progress. I've listed them across a longer study, along this talk. But the key pathogen focus, Salmonella and Campylobacter are the leading cause of foodborne illness in Australia and are associated with poultry. Though not all cases are linked to poultry. You could see the dominance of Campylobacteriosis over Salmonella, Salmonellosis over time. But this is not just an Australian problem. It's an international problem as well. And I've highlighted data from the EU. Campylobacteriosis is the most commonly reported zoonosis next to Salmonellosis. And broiler meat has been regarded as the most important single source for humans. So what was the basis of our research? Our research was to assist the poultry industry with background research to aid in decision making on the management of both Salmonella and Campylobacter levels across the farms. To better demonstrate the quantitative approach, that is the enumerator, enumeration of pathogens that can be adopted on farm to manage pathogen levels to assist the industry to be better able to address issues related to the environmental movement of pathogens in around farms, largely from regulatory concerns. To develop a resource document for decision makers, both at the industry level and external to the industry or government. So the first one was pathogen levels in litter. This was essentially about litter that left the shed. Uh, there was a need to conduct a risk assessment and this involved enumerating pathogens. Our study design was as follows. We uh, had selected three states, Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria. And the farms were selected based on market share. The litter material ranged from pine shavings to hardwood to, to rice hulls. No doubt Queensland was the only state reusing at the time. There were appreciable levels of salmonella and campylobacter, though not high. The seed of our dominance could be potentially linked to states, whereas Salmonella sophia was the dominant seed of our across all states, though it's rarely linked with human illness. So in summary, Salmonella and Campylobacter can be present in low levels, but from a pathogen perspective, an important consideration for reuse in agricultural setting is the impact of any treatment prior to agricultural reuse. And this was broadly addressed via a risk assessment and guideline document produced by Nicholas et al. that looked at human and animal health plus environmental sustainability to minimize human health risks. The next study was the Australian partial litter reuse practice. What happens here is litter is piled at the back of the shed for a period of time, uh, four to five days and spread. New bedding is spread at the front end of the shed. There's a curtain in the middle around 14 days, the chickens move across to the back of the shed. So our, our work was to study these litter pileup cycles and compare the final cycle before a full clean out, comparing the new end and the reused end in terms of pathogens. So our study design, we had two farms, farm one and farm two. Farm one pile pushed up twice and before he went out for a full clean out, farm two pushed up five times before he went for a full clean out. And uh, we tested both far farms, and this was how we tested the new and reuse. I'll focus on this later. So sampling of litter piles for pathogens also included physical parameters that can be of impact to survival. We collected surface and core samples for litter. We logged our temperatures on the surface and the cores with these long probes put into the pile. And we collected litter when the chickens were in for the final part of the study. This slide shows you litter pile temperatures on the top surface and cores, which the top and bottom surfaces reached a temperature of 55 degrees that is conducive for pathogen die off, but not the bottom cores. They reached about 30 to 40 degrees. This slide shows you the litter pH across the piles. This is the two piles on farm one and three in farm two. The surface, the blue representing the surface pHs 
and read the core PHS, no doubt a temperature of pH of around 8.5, which is conducive to pathogen dialysis achieved across the piles. This slide shows you Campylobacter die-off in sequential piles in farm two. <clears throat> if you look at the three cycles, one, two, and three, there was appreciable levels of Campylobacter just prior final pickup. We tested the top, bottom core, sub cores represented by red stars, and no doubt Campylobacter died off very quickly in these piles. This slide shows you Salmonella die-off. I've just picked up two random styles to show you. This instance, Salmonella was present, but very quickly died off. But there were instances where, uh, instance where Salmonella was below detection limit, and due to conducive probably temperature conditions in the tile, there was some regrowth, regrowth. But no doubt by day four, it died off. Now, to studying where I said we would be studying the new end and comparing with the reused end. Essentially, that's the new end with new bedding. That's the back end with reuse bedding. We had a buffer zone in the middle, and there were chickens right across uh, during this study. But the first thing we did was we studied surfaces for salmonella in the shed of farm A and B with weekly testing, drinker lines, feeder lines, feeder, and everything that I have listed there was negative for salmonella, excepting litter. Uh, now, this slide shows you the litter temperatures, the basis at the time when we collected our pathogens. This is prior placement, the blue representing new bedding, the pink representing, sorry, blue representing reuse bedding, and then pink representing new bedding. Um, it was slightly higher prior placement, probably due to microbial activity, but very soon the temperatures uh, sort of across the shed more or less were the same on both sides. The peaks representing chicken movement. This slide shows you Campylobacter levels in the new and reuse ends of farm one and farm two. These two colors representing the new and these two colors representing the reuse. Now it's about week two when we see the chickens move across. It's about week two here, the chickens move across. But Campylobacter colonization generally occurs around mid cycle and there was no difference in what happened in the two ends of the sheds with the levels being not too different. Now this slide shows you the salmonella levels of the new and reuse end, the new being magenta, the reuse being green. We know that salmonella died off prior being used in this cycle and we tested both ends of the shed. Uh, there was no chicken in the reused end at this stage, but no sooner placement occurs, salmonella levels reach high appreciable levels uh, in the front end of the shed in the new bedding. This is where the chicks move across. No sooner the chicks move across, you could see appreciable salmonella levels in the reuse as well. And this is day 14, and the same happened there. In terms of salmonella, this slide shows you salmonella cerevas and the new and reuse ends. So I've just picked, this is farm one and farm two. I picked Chester here and Singapore here. In terms of dominance, this is the new end of the shed with the young chicks. The cerevas, Chester was detected and was present across in the new end right through. That's when the chickens move across and you could see it emerging now in the reuse end. This is the new end and um, that's where they move across. It's in the new end and emerges later in the reuse end. One of the interesting things we noted was Sophia. Sophia emerged in the reuse end and then moved to the new end in both so this is a bit interesting because we have also detected so far in new uh, farms using new bedding. There was a range of other cerevas uh, not present in the reuse end or uh, in the new end. So in summary, Salmonella and Campylobacter had potential to die off in four to six days. Temperature was totally not responsible. There's high ammonia when you stand in front of those piles at the start. There was poor survival of salmonella on the surfaces, and there seems to be no major influence when comparing both ends of the shed in terms of levels and serovas with the reuse end supported a less serova diversity. Now the next one is to compare litter practices during commercial farming. This happened in three independent sheds. That's one of our farms, shed one, shed two, shed three. We compared the partial litter reuse practice with full reuse and with full clean out on new bedding. We enumerated both salmonella and campylobacter, but this time it was both litter and chickens. 
So that's our second farm with the, the three sheds allocated to the treatment. We tested this across six sequential cycles, starting off with a full clean out for partial reuse and reuse. The partial reuse was the Australian litter reuse practice. The full reuse operated based on the American practice because we wanted to understand that. The trial lasted one year on each farm. It was over a two, two, two years across both farms. Now, before we started the experiment, we validated the experimental design statistically to ensure that each shed was operating as an independent unit to ensure comparison, and that worked out. Then we had a random sampling design where we collected litter and chickens in the same end. Now, litter was managed between cycles, partial and full reuse, and that's farm one. Farm one created a pile for the partial reuse, but farm two just left this litter flat uh, during uh, the turnaround period during the partial reuse practice. Full litter reuse was a new practice and litter was piled across like this before being pushed back before the next cycle. Uh, we did microbiology and physical parameters. We tested salmonella levels and serovas, campylobacter levels and species. We tested on day seven litter only to assess carryover. Prior first pickup included litter and bird. Prior final pickup included litter and bird. I would only just focus on this today. We collected our samples on farm ourselves to ensure integrity of sample collection and comparison. Sampling on farm lasted almost a day. This is just some physical parameters to show how the litter was behaving. In the terms of, uh, this is day seven, there's a slight bit of variation in terms of moisture, percentage moisture, but no sooner the chickens move across the litter practices don't show much variation. In terms of pH, you'd see that uh, at the early stages, you'd see a slightly higher pH where new bedding or reuse bedding was involved. But then once um, through mid-cycle, we tested this only three times, the litter remained around 8 to 8.5 across all sheds. Now, I, I told you we were just going to look at uh, carryover based on the grow-out end. So before I take you to the data, I'd just like to show you these two uh, understand the next two slides. That's the shed with new litter. That's the shed with partial reuse. That's the shed with full reuse. We are looking at the grow out end at the back and we're looking at these two data points across the three sheds. So this is salmonella levels in litter on farm one. If you see a yellow bar or it's an appreciable level, a green dot is present in 25 gram if it was too low to detect. And we detected it in some ends. This is the brood end. There's no chickens at this stage in the, sorry, the grow out end at the back of the shed. And we detected something, some low levels. But compare that with the yellow bars and the gray bars and the pink bars, which represent the time when chickens are on litter and the levels are much higher. This is the next farm, sorry, the earlier farm he did pile up. This farm spread litter for his turnaround period. We saw some here, but at this stage, no litter practices were operating. This was after a full clean out. And we just saw it, sorry, one more time uh, during the third cycle. But compare those levels to what's the, uh, in terms of yellow bars with the chickens, the gray and the pink, and those levels are much higher in litter. So salmonella carryover from the reuse end was not a major concern. At placement, salmonella levels could in Sika could be around log four, litter could be a log, log three, and this was generally lower compared to Campylobacter levels in Sika, which I'll talk to you later, about later. We compared the levels of salmonella in litter prior first and second pickup across practices, there were no statistically significant differences. In terms of Sika, there was a difference with the new being slightly higher, with the Sika salmonella levels prior first pickup compared to partial and full reuse. But what prior second pickup, there were no different, no statistically significant difference, differences. The serovas that came along generally were cycle, de uh, were cycle dependent and generally were around the same across the three sheds. In summary, there was no major influence due to reusing litter, partial or full reuse compared to the conventional practice. Now in terms of salmonella, campylobacter levels in litter in Sika farm one, F1, farm two, F2. 
So F1, cycle one, and F2, so the six cycles, and these are the two farms. The top block represents Salmonella Campylobacter levels and in C candida prior first pickup. The second block represents Campylobacter levels in Sika and litter prior second pickup. The Sika data represented by this, this and the, the, sorry, the litter data by this symbol and chicken da, Sika data by this symbol. So point one, until the chickens were, had appreciable levels of Campylobacter, it was not detected in litter prior first pickup, as you can see. Point, point number two, thin out had occurred. This is around the time Campylobacter colonizes. Point two, if you look at the second, this is prior second pickup. There are high levels of Campylobacter very rapidly in the chicken, log eight to nine generally. There are appreciable levels in litter, generally four, four logs less. Point three, which was interesting, a cycle two on farm two remain totally Campylobacter negative. Now, some cycles can remain Campylobacter negative, but what was interesting here was there were three different litter practices in place. Um, I've written that up as a publication, so there'll be more detail. So in summary, Campylobacter levels around, Campylobacter colonization occurs around 28 to, to 30 days. The levels in Sika can be quite high, there was no influence in the dominance of Jejunia or Coli. We did see a Campylobacter free cycle. There was no significant differences in the levels of Campylobacter in litter or Sika across the three litter practices. Now, generally, good management and biosecurity are already adopted means for control, but Campylobacter still remains a universal problem. There needs to be a better understanding of the colonization of broilers. I've addressed this in the research summary and in this poultry science publication. Well, the next one is on-farm Campylobacter dynamics with the inclusion of free range. So this study was to compare the Campylobacter levels in litter and Sika, but also soil and carcasses. And we had four practices. This was the original full clean out, partial litter reuse, and free range with and without reuse. And the next one was to provide knowledge to explore the potential of phage therapy to be adop adopted at a farm level. A study design involved two companies, company A and company B. Company A had all four litter practices. Company B just had the conventional full clean out. We did this across two years, uh, 24 farm samplings, 15 farms were involved. We tested Campylobacter and Campylobacteria phages. Now, Campylobacter bacterial phages are bacterial viruses that can kill Campylobacter, and the phage Campylobacter dynamics is, a pre, is in a predator prey relationship, naturally occurring in the chicken gut. So, in summary, we uh, address Campylobacter dynamics looking at Campylobacter levels, species diversity, populations, and phages. Most importantly, there was no statistically significant difference in Campylobacter levels in the Sika, litter, soil, and carcasses across practices. No influence in Jejunicoli dominance. And the farming environment, conventional reuse free range does not seem to play a major role uh, based on our studies to pinpoint any specific on-farm control. We isolated around 900 bacteriophages, which in the next study, uh, we were able to uh, move on to phage biocontrol. Now, uh, today there are no commercial options to control Campylobacter in, on, on farm. So we had two projects. The first one was a proof of concept study to control Campylobacter using bacteriophages. This involved two farm trials, including reuse farms. And the next one was moving, moving from concept to control, which I just completed, which built on that. So I'll briefly take you through study five. Essentially what happened there was uh, uh, on one of the farms, on both farms actually we saw statistically significant reduction of two logs, but this is published and I'm not going to deal with this. Um, this is an open access and can be accessed. But essentially I'd like to read to you what my collaborator, professor. So, sorry, we carried this study out in collaboration with the University of Nottingham. Uh, and this study in collaboration with the University of Nottingham with Professor Connerton and Dr. Craig Billington from the Environmental Sciences Research in New Zealand. So essentially this is from the study, the proof of concept, as I said, I wouldn't focus on that, but I would like to focus on um, what Professor Connerton uh, described this study. 
This study describes the first steps of moving bacteriophage therapy to reduce Campylobacter in chickens from experimental bird setting to a commercial environment. They did a lot of experimental work in Nottingham in the UK. Rational selection of bacteriophages from an optimized 19 phage panel specific to the indigenous Campylobacters on selected Queensland farms shows how the application of bacteriophage therapy can make the leap from theory to practice. There are many reviews on phage therapy <clears throat> highlighting the potential of the treatment, but very few examples of actual application in the real world. And ours was the second published study. So the next one is microbiology of aerosols in and around meat chicken sheds. Obviously, most of you would know the reason for this is the growth of urban population around farms and conflicts with neighbors to farms. This study tested aerosols existing from tunnel ventilated farms, including reuse farms are included in this study. This is all published and the reports are available. But essentially what I'd like to say here is the levels in air depended on the levels in litter, whether it be reused or other farms. Uh, but one of the main messages was Campylobacter and Salmonella in aerosols were not of concern. So in summary, our studies have provided previously unavailable Australian data and scientific outcomes to assist industry. The research summary of this work targets the various segments of the Australian chicken meat industry, national state organizations and governments who have a role in food safety, the regulators to the chicken meat industry. Now I had an opportunity to present this work to the regulators in Queensland, and they were very appreciative of having a different understanding of really what happens in terms of salmonella and Campylobacter on farm to aid how they may go about things. So I think it's important. Finally, the scientific understanding and the vast industry practical experience can collectively derive applied outcomes to collaboratively address on farm food safety. Why I say this is we can provide the core science and the basis, but practically to achieve this, we have to work with the farmers or the farms or the industry so that it's practically applicable. And you've seen examples of slightly different people doing things slightly different, but the overall outcome was the same. So should there be other drivers such as regulatory, these studies provide a unique Australian data to develop risk-based management systems to support litter reuse from a food safety perspective. And why I say this is I've done a similar set of studies like this for the pig industry on effluent reuse. And just last year, as I had to write this research summary, I had to write a research summary based on that, the pig industry. And one of the things was to survey human effluent reuse guidelines to gain inspiration on how to manage pig effluent. And those guidelines have largely moved away from prescriptive approach to risk-based approach. And these were just not Australian, they were international EU guidelines as well to give some inspiration to the pig industry. So should the need arise. Finally, focusing on all management, management of all litter practices from a food safety perspective, ease of merit not just reuse. I'd like to acknowledge my funders, the former RIRDC AgriFutures Australia Chicken Meat Program that funded most of the work, the former Poultry CRC that funded some of our projects, my department, the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries Queensland, and to my industry collaborator, collaborators. Most importantly, to Dr. Margaret McKenzie, who guided me, helped me, and provided all resources to carry out a lot of this work, which I couldn't have done without the support of Margaret, access to farms at Ingham, so on. I'd like to acknowledge Kelly McTavish, who helped me with all farm trials, a lot of the stuff to be done on farm, um, which I couldn't have done. To Andrew, who helped us with the Campylobacter phage therapy studies, and Rod for providing access while he was in Golden Cockerel to farms for the aerosol studies and um, for the Campylobacter survey. To all Inghams and Dawala farmers who provide access to the many farms in Bow Desert, Redlands, Mount Cotton, Carbrook, Kabulcha, Donnybrook, Katten, and Jimbuba, specifically to two farmers who undertook the three shed trials for one long year, who kept those litter practices in place at their cost. I appreciate that. To staff from both company labs, to my international collaborators, Professor Ian and Philippa Connerton and Dr. Craig Billington from Environmental Sciences Research in New Zealand for the FARGE work I was able to do with their collaboration. Finally, but least not all, my staff at DAF, my excellent technicians who spend hours on these farms and lab work, and to the scientists from DAF who supported me. 
With that, I say thank you for listening. Thank you, Nalini. That was a very interesting presentation and uh, you've been very busy and uh, it's good to see so much great research going on and, and, and I, I wish uh, that that sort of research can continue into the future. We do have uh, time for one quick question. Um, we do have a question here from Nishal Sharma. And Nishal's question is, thanks Nalini for the presentation. If there was not much difference in Campylobacter and Salmonella counts between new and reuse litter, what is the main reason Australia is hesitant to use reuse litter in meat chicken farms? I think we need uh, webinars like this for this research to go out and people to really understand the research that has taken place. So it's probably, it, Queensland has been using it for 30 years. It's 30 years now. When I started, it was 20 years. So it's not that Australia is resistant. Queensland has been doing it. I think we need to get the information out in a manner that people understand. This is from a food safety perspective, but no doubt, the farms that I worked had been using litter for 20 years. So I don't know whether it's lack of understanding or we need to, um, I could speak with Queensland because, you know, Queensland has been using it probably now 30 years. When I started 10 years or more ago, it was 10, 20 years. Yeah, I think you're right. From what I can see is sort of regions use, some regions or companies tend to use yeah, it's New litter, sort of not having reused, and it's yeah. So some do it. Some use reused litter. Some use new litter all the time, and it can vary region by region or company by company. So there could be perceptions right. also that need to be addressed, and you know, some companies have been doing it for a long time. Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, just uh, thank you very much, Nalini. I might remind everyone that uh, you can type in at any time uh, for questions. So we don't have to wait till the Q and A session. So uh, let's uh, now we have to move on. So any questions that are put in, like even right now, we will um, get to them in the uh, the Q and A. So uh, um, our next speaker is Debbie Fisher, um, and Debbie's presentation is going to be on litter quality on farm management. And Debbie is the technical services manager for Avigen Australia New Zealand. Um, but just before Debbie speaks, uh, Eurek uh, is going to talk about another one of our items in the hamper. Thanks, Eurek. And thanks. thanks, Nalini, for the presentation. Yeah. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, so the next item is uh, some kangaroo island arts and crackers, and uh, I think they are very delicious, uh, made from a single origin wheat, uh, liquid honey from the pristine land of Kangaroo Island in South Australia. And uh, my joke, what do you get if you cross a kangaroo in a jeep? A woolly good jumper. Thank you very much. And Debbie, the attention was you. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be talking about litter quality from a farm management perspective in the next 30 minutes. So no matter what your um, operation you're working in, whether it's grandparents, parents, broilers, it's very important that we do maintain good, dry, quality, um, friable litter at all times throughout that cycle with low ammonia. There's a lot of reasons why, um, hang on, sorry, I'll just minimise that so I'm not looking at everyone. There's a lot of reasons why um, your litter can become crusty or wet. Um, the list is here, nutrition, poor gut health. Um, our next speaker, Judy, is going to talk to you about that. I'm going to concentrate today on, on the things we can do from a farm management perspective. So understanding and managing our ventilation correctly, drinking management, water quality, our litter material that we use, our stocking densities and biosecurity. So ventilation is a huge subject and, and I'm not, I'm just going to touch on, on what um, areas can, can give you some litter concerns. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time today speaking about it, <coughs> excuse me, but ventilation is the control of the air. So when we talk about ventilation, we're talking about controlling the air, controlling where the air comes into the shed, where it's not coming into the shed, where we want it to go once it does enter the shed how fast it's traveling, how much we want to bring in and maintaining the correct temperature and humidity when, within the shed. So when we talk about ventilation, we talk about control and control means we've got a good sealed 
airtight shed. Now, for some of you who may have older shedding or curtain side shedding, um, there are a lot of challenges that come with that to, to get a good sealed shed and get good pressure. So in your newer shedding, the, more, the less leakage you have, um, the better control you have. And obviously the more leakage you have, the less control you have of where the, all of these things are happening, the air coming in and the air direction. Okay, so there's three modes of ventilation that we um, talk about when, we're, when we talk about ventilation. We have minimum ventilation, we have what we call transitional ventilation, and then we have what we call tunnel ventilation. So minimum ventilation is when we're operating below set point. This is usually our wintertime ventilation where the outside temperature is colder than, than the inside temperature we're trying to maintain. It's important though we are running minimum ventilation because we still need to be bringing fresh oxygen into the shed and we need to be removing the gases and the moisture that the birds are adding to the shed while we're maintaining that shed temperature. Transitional ventilation is when we've We've, shed's now starting to operate above the set point, but we're starting to bring more air in, but we haven't moved to tunnel. And tunnel ventilation is when we start to try and keep our birds comfortable. It's hot outside. We're, we're talking summertime um, conditions where we need to start increasing the airspeed to ensure good bird comfort, but at the same time still maintain good litter quality. So starting with the minimum ventilation, this must be running from placement. You cannot run a shed without ventilation and minimum ventilation ensures that we're bringing in the, the oxygen the birds require and at the same time we're removing the gases and the moisture that, that they're producing. So it's important we have a good sealed shed to ensure we get a good negative pressure and negative pressure is all about giving us control over where our air is going and what's happening on the inside. It reduces the effect of the outside environment so it's not compromising our inside environment too much and it helps us use the heat we have stored in the shed in the ceiling cap cavity to condition the air, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we need to ensure we get good even distribution of the heat from our heat source. So it's important we don't under, um, undervalue how many heaters we have placed in our shed. It's about having the correct amount of heaters to ensure we've got good even heat, heat spread throughout the shed. We don't want to over or under cycle because this is where we get caught out a lot of times in our litter condition turns because we're either um, running our, our um, minimum ventilation too long and we're bringing cold wet air onto the floor or we're under cycling and we're not um, removing the, the built up moisture and the humidity in the shed and, and it's been absorbed onto the floor. So we can over or under cycle with our minimum ventilation and cause problems with litter condition. High humidity, um, if, if there's one take home point from this presentation today is that when your humidity starts to climb in your shed, it's an indication that you're gonna start having litter concerns. The first port of call is when your humidity starts to climb, you need to start investigating why this is happening before day two, day three, day four, and then you start to see that crusting on the litter. So keep in mind, you should be monitoring your humidity because this is a very good indicator of when um, things are starting to change. So why is the negative pressure important? It's important because it, um, it's about where the air enters evenly through every inlet. So if your shed leaks, if you've got lots of cracks and gaps, if you've got curtains, it means that the air is going to come through wherever there's the least resistance. Um, we want to control, as I mentioned in the beginning, we want to control where that air is coming in because we need to condition it before we bring it to the floor. If we've got a lot of leakage in our shed, then potentially we're going to have some issues with um, that, that wet air going straight to the floor and, and making our litter go crusty. So by spreading the inlets evenly, we can um, give even fresh air distribution up into that ceiling cavity. By restricting the inlet size, we then can regulate the speed at which it travels up. So we ensure it throws up into that peak of the roof. And then we can control how far that air, air then goes into the shed and onto the floor. So pressure enables us to move the air to where we want it. So it's all about us controlling that ventilation. These are just some photos of where you can have leakage in sheds. Um, if you have the, the opportunity to, to use a thermal imaging camera or you have an attachment for your phone, um, it's a great way to see um, quite quickly where you have dark um, cold spots. So for example, this picture here, we can see that these fans, um, there's probably backdrafting happening. The, dark, the darker the color, the colder the temperature, the hot, hotter the color. So this is a heater, the, more, the, the warmer the temperature. Probably having backdrafting coming through fans that aren't being used. We've got leakage um, through back doors. We can see here um, cooling panels that are not covered and there's a lot of air being pulled through them when the fans run. 
to the point that we can see all the birds have actually moved away from this, this area because it's cold. We've got panel doors that are shut, but we can see that they're not sealed properly and they're leaking and they're even leaking here to the point we can actually see the air is coming in. And if you don't have the ability to use an infrared, you can always just turn your lights off and, and see where the sunlight's coming in, usually under doors or around fans that aren't sealed properly. When your minimum ventilation runs, you'll be pulling air through these um, places and you have no control of where they're going. So that cold, damp air can, can be falling onto the floor and causing the crusting. So as I mentioned, it's about pressure, it's about taking the air, controlling the air as we bring it in and making sure we're conditioning it. So we want the air to come through the, the vents, we want it to run up the ceiling into the, into the peak of the roof where the heat is, we want to dry that air out and then we want it to cycle down and then remove the moisture and gas, gases out through the fans. If we have incorrect pressure, too much leakage, we will find we can't throw the air high enough and we have it falling on the floor. Think of this incoming air as like a kitchen sponge. So when the kitchen sponge is saturated and you try to wipe it along the bench and wipe up a spill, you can't absorb any of that spill when you're potentially just adding more moisture to it. Think of this air coming in as your kitchen sponge that has, is full of moisture. When it falls to the floor, it's got no absorbent capacity. So it's not gonna remove any moisture and it's potentially gonna add moisture. What we're doing here is as we throw it into the ceiling and we dry and condition that air, we're removing the moisture from the sponge. So as it comes to the floor, we can now wipe the bench with a dry sponge and we can absorb that moisture and take it out. This is why it's important we understand where our air is coming in and where our air is going so we're conditioning it correctly. These are just a guide of what your pressure should be if you can check your pressures in the shed, depending on the width of your shed. Most sheds now, newer sheds are around that 15 to 18 metre mark, so you should be achieving around that 20 to 25 pascals. Um, air inlet settings are important when we're managing our minimum ventilation. So your inlets, and again, this is just a starting point, you may find you might have to run them slightly um, more open or slightly shut, but as a guide, three to four centimetre opening when you're running a minimum ventilation. Having fewer inlets open um, is better than having um, too many open. If you have all your inlets open, because these newer sheds again are designed to have inlets for minimum ventilation and then inlets for transitional. So when you're in minimum ventilation, you shouldn't have all of your um, vents open because you'll find your pressure won't be correct. They'll have to open less and then you'll have the air hitting the ceiling and, and bouncing down. So ensure you're only using the correct amount of inlets to achieve that three to four centimetre opening to get that correct pressure. All the inlets that you are using should be opening equally. Um, and they should all be evenly distributed down the shed. So both sides of the sheds, we should see um, the, the vents open to the same, same opening. So this is just a picture of a standard um, vent inlet. Um, what I just wanted to point out was a couple of things. If you're buying new, if you're building a new shed, if you're doing a replacement, just keep in mind these few, few points because they can help with you controlling the air. So an air direction plate is great because as the vent begins to open, they can help run that air up into that ceiling um, space. If you have an older shed with, which has a lot of the beams, exposed beams, wires and cables, those all disrupt the air flow and can potentially make the air drop to the floor sooner than you need. These air direction plates can help guide that air up past those, um, bar those barriers if they're in their way and get it up to that where that heat is. This hook system is very good on um, these vents. I talked about how all the vents and inlets in your shed are not there just for minimum ventilation. The system allows you to use half of them. Every second one, for example, will be hooked on the top hook and then the other ones will be hooked on the bottom one so that when you're running in minimum ventilation and you're only opening to that three to four centimetre gap, that only the ones on the top hook, for example, will open to that spacing. When you go into a transitional and it's more about airflow and they have to open right up, then all of them will open because the cable will pull longer and it'll pull them both down. The other thing that I like about this design is this door frame here. So what happens is when the vents begin to open, the fans have also started running. So this just minimizes any air that may escape out of the sides and fall to the floor. By having this barrier here, as you start to open again, it's keeping the air enclosed and only going out through where the gap is, which is at the top. So to evaluate our minimum ventilation, um, we, the best way to do it is to get in the shed in the morning and, and determine what you think is, is a good air quality. So in the morning, you should be entering the shed for the first 30 to 60 seconds and just standing there and just, and just observing what the birds are doing and, and smelling the air and making your decisions. 
So do the birds look comfortable? Are they spread evenly? Are they active? Are they at the feeder? Are they at the drinker? Are they milling around? Does the air smell stuffy or feel stuffy first thing in the morning? What is your humidity level? Do, are you having problems with ammonia? Can you smell a lot of ammonia? Can you see condensation or sweating on walls or drinker pipes or anything that's stale in the shed? And what's the overall air quality feeling like or smelling like to you? What you feel in the first 30 to 60 seconds is what the chicken has had to live with through the whole nighttime um, growing phase. It's important that we, if we find any of these things, if we're concerned that the air is a bit stuffy, our humidity levels are high, we are getting condensation, that we go and start doing some investigating, whether it's on the, the ventilation or, or a few of the other things I'm going to speak about um, soon, and try and work out what the problem is. Purging, which a lot of people do in the morning, they will purge the sheds where they'll run a whole lot of tunnel, uh, tunnel fans to clear the air before they go in because they don't like the smell. All that is doing is just uh, making it comfortable for you while you're in the shed. It's not fixing the problem. It's not working out what is happening and then going in and trying to rectify it or even learning from it. It may be too, too late to improve things, but by learning why this has happened, then you can make those changes for the next cycle. So it's important that we don't just purge to um, make it um, comfortable for ourselves, but we try and determine why has my litter become damp or crusty? What, what's causing this problem? What can, I, what can I investigate? Transitional ventilation isn't um, really an issue when it comes to litter quality, but I'm just gonna quickly touch on it because we do phase through to it to um, tunnel. So this operates once we start to get over set point. Um, it involves um, using all of your side arm wall inlets at this point. We can be using some of our tunnel fans. Um, we're starting to bring more air into the shed. We're starting to um, move a bit more air through the shed, but it's about keeping those birds comfortable without going into tunnel mode. So it could be that it's getting, it's uh, spring or autumn weather now. So we're getting a little bit warmer days. Your birds aren't maybe feathered up. So you don't really want to go into a tunnel scenario just yet and create too much airspeed through them. But this can help um, keep the birds comfortable while those temperatures are starting to climb. So tra transitional ventilation, as I mentioned, is now using all of the wall inlets. You maybe are starting to use some of your tunnel ones, but we're still bringing the air up into the roof and then cycling it through the birds. Okay, tunnel ventilation is sometimes where people get caught out with um, their litter turning as well because of the way they're running the evaporative cooling. So we know evaporative cooling will reduce the air temperature like, a, like an air conditioning unit. Keep in mind when you run your evaporative cooling, you're adding humidity to the environment. So you're adding humidity into the shed. When your birds are hot and they're panting, they're using their internal, internal evaporative cooling system to, to release heat. So they're releasing moisture into the air as well. If the humidity is high in the shed, it reduces the efficiency of that panting because like the sponge, there's only so much capacity of um, moisture that can be held in the air. And if you've added to that, to that moisture and you've increased that humidity, the efficiency of the painting is now being reduced and the birds may be struggling even more, even though um, they're painting. So keep that in mind from, a, from an animal welfare perspective. But it's important again that we do monitor those humidity levels in the sheds because we still want to maintain 60 to 70 percent. So we need to make sure we're not running our cooling pads and making that humid over running our cooling pads, sorry, and adding too much humidity or moisture into that environment. So there's two ways to keep birds comfortable, and this is where um, I think sometimes people get lost because they think they need to drop the temperature and cool the birds. Air speed is one way we can keep our birds comfortable. So even though our thermometer might be saying 30 degrees, if we're achieving a very high um, air speed, the birds will actually be quite comfortable. And evaporative cooling can also help. So that's when we start wetting our pads and introducing our spray systems. Without a doubt, air speed is by far the most important when it comes to trying to keep your birds comfortable. So it's important that we understand this so we don't react and turn on our cool pads too quickly and too often and end up adding too much moisture into that environment and, and, and causing us to have crusty litter. Cooling is a very distant second because the birds, how they feel their airspeed helps them cool down and it's not necessarily what the thermometer is saying now. So here's a photo of two, um, sh the same shed running at different airspeeds. So we can see the picture on the left hand side. This was 1.25 meters per second, and we can see a lot of pink and yellow, which indicates quite a high temperature on the birds. As soon as more fans were introduced and the airspeed jumped up to two and a half meters per second, we can see the overall bird comfort has improved because their body temperature has come down. Your thermometer will read the same on both of these. 
but the way the birds are reacting is, is different. So the purpose of the cooling pad when it's running with the water is not to reduce the shed temperature. And I think this is sometimes where we get um, lost. The purpose is to maintain the temperature. So we've been moving through the day, our temperatures have been climbing, more fans have started to come into play. We've gone it through into our, our full tunnel mode and we've now got to a temperature we feel that the um, cool pad needs to come on. When we do run that cool pad, the, the, the reason for it is we want to just keep that temperature from rising any higher. Your birds can be quite comfortable in 28 degrees if they've got good airspeed. And that's going to be dependent on the number of birds, the density, the age of the birds, um, the fan capacity. Keep in mind, we don't want to drop that temperature because what happens a lot of times I see is that the cool pads are saturated, the temperature drops. The first thing that happens when our temperature drops is our fans turn off. We've now got a lot of um, damp, uh, high humidity air in the shed and we're not running a lot of fans anymore. So that moisture is going to end up on the floor as well as at the same time causing the birds to feel a lot hotter because when the humidity's up, they feel a hotter temperature. So it's about using our fan capacity, ensuring that we're not oversaturating our pads. There is a time and a place, don't get me wrong, there is a time and a place for the cooling, but it's understanding that we're not trying to reduce that temperature. We're just trying to stop it from climbing any higher and making sure our birds are comfortable. So cooling pads should not run continuously when first activated, and that's where sometimes people get caught out. What we should have, or you should have, is a cycle, an on-off cycle to control how much water is going onto those pads and for how long. So initially when we first um, run the, the, the water, we should be only running for a few seconds. We just want to saturate maybe the top, a little bit of the top of the pad. And again, this will come from experience. You'll know your own sheds, you'll know your own setups, and you'll determine how much um, wet how much of the pad you need to, to wet to, to achieve what you're after. The, the main thing is we're not saturating the pad completely and we're only, what we're doing is we're, when the air is coming through and some of it's wet and some of it's dry, we've got cold air and, and warm air. As it passes through the pad, it then mixes and the temperature is still lower, but we haven't added, that's helped, the warm air has helped remove some of that moisture and we're not, um, as I mentioned, we're not reducing that temperature, we're just main, maintaining it. Um, what I should say is that when you're running your systems, whether it's a minimum ventilation or your cooling pads or your tunnel ventilation, observe your birds and determine if they're comfortable. If they're not standing up, or if they're not um, eating and drinking, then, then you need to reevaluate how you're running your ventilation. Okay, drinking management. So it's very important that we provide clean, sanitized water at all times to our birds, and we must maintain and check our drinker system daily. We need to replace any leaking or blocked nipples as soon as we see them because, again, if we're, if we're having issues with our drinker systems and, we're, and there's um, leaking nipples, that will cause you litter problems. It's important we have a water meter on each shed to monitor the water intake because a lot of times that will tell us very quickly if something's wrong. We've got leaking nipples, has a hose come off the end of the drinker, or are we starting to, to face a coxie challenge and we're seeing the water intake um, increase? Avoid having high water pressure. This is a lot of times when we get water on the floor, particularly in those first couple of weeks. Um, the chicks can't drink it, it, it squirts. It's very hard for them to um, get to. And adjust the drinker height daily as the birds grow. And I just wanna make a quick comment on that point. I see in my travels a lot now that we're starting to get a little bit too focused on our litter quality and we're forgetting about our bird welfare because a lot of drink lines are a little bit too high because people are worried about their um, litter and you're gonna have issues with your smaller birds not being able to drink or having to spend a lot of time walking around trying to find a, a, a line that's a little bit lower. If you're having wet litter from your drinkers and your height's correct, then you need to again address why am I having this problem? What is it because of the height? Is it because I've got leaking nipples? Is my pressure wrong? Are my drinkers, drinkers dirty? So again, it just we need to start digging in and finding what these problems are. So from zero, from day one to uh, seven days, the nipple should be at eye, eye level for the chick. The chick needs to be able to find the nipple, peek at it, explore, what is this all about? Okay, this is where I find my water. From one week onwards, we start to lift that, that nipple line and we should be at a 45 degree angle. So at this point, the chick, the bird can activate the nipple and when it does activate the water, most of the water hopefully is running down their throat and not squirting out on the floor. Obviously, if it's too low and they have to activate it on, on an angle, there'll be a lot of water wastage, which will give you litter problems. And if it's too high, we've got some animal welfare issues. So another picture just showing us um, the correct angle that the birds should be accessing that nipple. 
Okay, this is again just a guide, a starting point for where your water consumption should be. So working on the theory, if your shed was running it at, at, constantly, most of the time running at a 21 degree um, environment, and depending on the, um, the type of drinker you were using, you would be looking at about, most people have nipple with drip tray, so you'd be looking at around about a 1.7 to one food ratio. Now, if you obviously are growing in a hotter environment, um, summertime, for example, you can allow, for, and again, this is purely a guide, about six and a half percent for every degree over 21 degrees. Again, this just gives you a starting point. You, you need to look back on your history, on your previous runs, set your targets, and you know that it, it's in summertime, at 20 days, my water consumption should be 1.8 or 1.9. And in winter time, it might be 1.6. It's important we keep our records so then we can determine when we're seeing a, a problem or seeing something different, we can react on it before the litter, um, we lose the litter. Flow rates are really important. Um, it should be checked weekly. Um, during the growing period, we have a, a how to, which I will go through in a minute on how to measure um, the flow rates. These again are recommendations for what your flow rates should be. So seven, zero to seven days, we have a lower flow rate for the, for the babies of 20 mils per minute. Then obviously as the birds get bigger, the flow rate um, increases. So once we're over 21 days, we're looking at it around 70 to 100 mils per minute and 70 being at the lowest end and 100 being at, at obviously at your regulator end. Um, it's important that we do measure these because a lot of times, particularly again in older farms and we're running um, drinker lines from one end of the shed to the other, people will turn down the, the, um, the regulators because they're finding that the flow rate's too high at the beginning and they're getting drips and, and squirting and everything and we're not getting enough water at the back. So this is when we go, okay, I'm not achieving my flow rate. I need to think about how I can fix this. Do I split the line and have a second drinker line halfway down? Do I put flow regulators in? It's a thing, again, this is a point where we go, this is not where it should be. I need to go and rectify it, not just, okay, I'll just turn it down and yeah, we'll worry about the other end, of, you know. So we need to fix the problems rather than just band-aid over them. So to measure your, your mills per minute, it's very simple. You just get a measuring cup, you put it up against the nipple, you activate the nipple and you time it for 30 seconds. Once the 30 seconds have passed, you stop. You measure how many mils you caught in that 30 seconds and double it and that gives you your mils per minute and then you do it in different locations across the shed because each line could be different and then obviously front and back will be different so it's important we understand um, what we're getting and then what we need to do to make sure we fall within the right range. Drinker cleaning is also important because a lot of times we can have biofilm build up which will give us issues with um, block nipples or reduced flow rates um, and bacterial contamination. Bacterial contamination is very important because um, if we get bacterial contamination into our birds and they've got not very good gut health, then we could have some issues with um, loose droppings. So it's important we have clean water and we have clean drink lines and, and, and processes to ensure um, we don't have any, um, we're not introducing anything that may cause diarrhea with the birds. So when you start adding things like vitamins to your water, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics, anything going into a water system has the potential to start um, causing biofilm or causing blockages. So just be, keep that in mind when you're in your clean outs that you are giving your systems a very good clean. Um, swab testing is a good way to check if your drinkers have been cleaned properly, depending on who you grow for or the company you work for. It may be something you're doing already or it may be something worth thinking about um, pulling the pipes apart after cleaning and just having a swab to see if they are actually as clean as you think they are. One of the other areas we need to also keep be mindful of is our regulators, because a lot of times we're not looking in these regulators, we're concentrating hard on the cleanliness of our pipes, and we're not worrying so much about where our water is coming through. Um, again, it doesn't hurt to pop open a regulator every now and then and just see what the diaphragm looks like. Is everything clean? A lot of times I see sight glasses that are green or red, um, so important that we are giving everything a good scrub because this, this is where we have potential concerns with um, bacterial contamination or biofilm. Water quality is also very important and most um, integrators will be doing something with their growers where they take a water sample every year and they test for all the things like hardness, the pH, the chlorides, the magnesium, the iron levels, all that sort of thing. It's very important that we do check our water quality, particularly um, if you're pulling off um, bore water, for example, uh, sorry, dam water, for example, where you could have had birds sitting on that dam. So 
Um, we have this table is in our handbook, which can be found on page 70 of our Ross Brawner handbook. And our handbook, if you don't have it, can be found um, on our website, which I'll mention at the end. So litter material is really important um, as well. So in New Zealand and Australia, we usually um, use pine shavings, which is the, the best litter material we can use. Um, other countries don't have that, um, that luxury, if you, if you want to call it a luxury of getting their hands on pine shavings. When I used to work in Asia, I used to see rice hulls, I've seen coconut husks, people use straw, sand, you know, anything that they can get their hands on. So pine shavings is the best um, floor material because it's the most absorbent, but we need to ensure that the, the pine shavings that we're getting, and I know for some people it can sometimes be a struggle to get pine shavings or to get dry pine shavings. Again, if your floor material is damp when it's been placed and you don't dry it or you can't dry it out before the chicks come in, you've got some issues um, from a growing perspective putting chicks on damp floor, but from a um, litter quality perspective, you've reduced the absorption of that absorption factor of that litter straight away. So again, that sponge scenario where you have a dry sponge is now half wet. So it's not gonna be able to absorb as much as it could have if it was dry. Ideally spread at least a minimum depth of five centimetres. If you go too thin, what can happen is when the faecal matter starts to build up, there's not a lot of um, pine shavings there, not a lot of floor material and it will pack down quite quickly and become hard. Stocking density for most of us is, is determined by the, the integrator. Um, they determine when they come and get the birds, they're monitoring the stocking densities, but it is important that we are aware of our, um, litter, our shed management as we're getting up to that first cut when we have that high density. So if we've got good management practices in place, so we've got good insulation in our shed, we're understanding your ventilation, we're drinkers at the right height, we don't have any um, water wastage going on, this can help minimise the impact of that high density prior to first cut. It's important that obviously we follow our local legislation in regards to our stocking densities, and for most of you that will already be determined by the integrator you're working for. I just wanted to touch on biosecurity because if we introduce a disease into the shed, this can we can have the best ventilation practices in the world and have excellent drinker management, but if we introduce something and that, and that can give them um, a gut health problem, then we will see our, our good litter turn very quickly. So everyone should have a good biosecurity program in place because there's so many different routes of disease that can come in if our biosecurity is lax. So people obviously can be introducing um, diseases into the sheds, our insects, the hatchery can if they're not very clean. As I mentioned, if we're pulling water from the dam, we could be introducing it through the drinker line. We shouldn't have any other poultry or livestock or animals around our sheds. Equipment and vehicles are a biggie. This is the one I really um, push with people. Oh, sorry, click too soon. You guys, you farm owners, the farm managers, you are the gatekeeper. You are the man or the woman who will determine who will have access to your farm and what will happen. You need to have good um, checks in place with visitor logs, lock gates, um, sanitizers at the gates, because you need to ask questions about where have you been? Where have you come from? Um, have you been on another farm? Have you been on another chicken farm? Have you been on a dairy farm? Were you around pigs? You know, these are all questions you need to ask. You should have a record, a visitor's record. So if something does happen, you can then start tracing back. Rodents, we all know, are very, very um, high um, vectors of, of disease. This is your salmonella source a lot of times. If your chicks could come in contaminated already, your litter if it's been stored um, outside for say for example and wild birds have been nesting in it, your feed, your housing and we know wild birds carry the same diseases. So very important that we um, maintain a good biosecurity practice to try and minimise anything um, entering the shed. So in summary, to maintain good litter conditions throughout the growing cycle, it's important we ensure we understand our ventilation and we run it correctly to ensure not only bird comfort and bird welfare, but also to manage that litter condition. Good drinker cleaning and management is very important, um, making sure we've got good clean water. Dry litter material is going to help you a lot with placement, correct nutritional input, good gut health, trying to minimise any overstocking. I know it's potentially out of your hands, but it's something that um, needs to be discussed with your integrator if, if it is a challenge. And good biosecurity, because you can have, as I mentioned, the best practices in the world, but if your biosecurity is lax, you could introduce something into the shed that will potentially um, cause you some carnage. Okay, so as I mentioned, you can find a lot of this information that I've spoken about today on our website, www.avegin.com. We have a lot of tech notes that are released by our tech teams and our um, people from globally. 
on all sorts of different um, subjects. We have posters, we have how-tos, and we have our handbook. So please feel free to jump online and, and have a look at what we've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, great uh, practical advice there from your, um, your um, many years of experience with dealing with the industry. Thank you very much for that. And uh, timing is perfect as well. So we're now um, going to take, take a break um, for 15 minutes. And so we will uh, come back at 2.35 Sydney time. So it'll be 1.35 in Queensland. Um, yeah, so uh, enjoy the break and um, yeah, and also, as I say, just type in any questions you think of and uh, we will get to them at the end. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope you're all refreshed and had a bit of wine. Um, we will now continue. Continue on. Um, just having trouble getting the slide to change again. Very good. I'll just take over, David. Hopefully, right. the slides change afterwards. So uh, this is a this is a third item uh, of the hamper set. So the brewer's nut, uh, co savory nut mix. So really nice mix of freshness and taste. It's roasted peanuts, cashews, almonds, pumpkin seeds, and sunflower seeds. Hopefully, uh, the chili flavored rosemary garlic sea salt flavored uh, nut mix is tasting really well for you. Unfortunately, I cannot trust and try it out. But anyhow, what do you get when you cross a squirrel and a spider? A bug that will run up your leg and eat your nuts. So hopefully that won't happen today. Judy, uh, I'll think uh, I'll hand over to you or David, will you introduce her first? Yes, thanks, Jurek. Uh, yes, we'll move on. So. Um, Okay, so our next speaker is Judy O'Keefe. So Judy is the director of Shorefeed, and her talk today is on gut health, nutrition, and litter quality in broilers and layers. And I'll change the slides for you, Judy, hopefully. It's all yours, thank you. Thanks, David. Hello, everybody. Um, so nice to be with you today. Thanks very much to David and Yurek for inviting me to participate in this uh, very good program. Um, it's nice to follow Deb um, because she's done a really good job of explaining um, that manure certainly has the ability to gain and lose moisture from the atmosphere. And um, while she looked at it from the broiler perspective, a lot of those principles also apply to layers, especially in floor systems, but even in cages as well. And um, I'll just make the point with cages it's terribly important to manage the ventilation of layer houses um, and terribly important to remove manure at least twice a week. And um, also to understand just how variable um, your manure quality can be depending on the weather. Um, there was a very interesting survey that you may wish to look up done by Australian Eggs a bit over 10 years ago, where they surveyed, um, well, really the composition of manure across many different cage facilities and they found a moisture content varying from 20 to 70 percent in manure. Now there's no way all of that can be due to dietary reasons. A lot of it was due to how ventilation was managed in the sheds and certainly whether or not the manure dryers were in use or were effective. So um, I'm really not going to go into detail talking about ventilation today so I'll be focusing on the things that are within the control of the nutritionist to try and do best from a dietary perspective to try and influence manure moisture. So really the first rule that I'll start with today is um, you can't solve a ventilation problem via the diet, but a poorly designed diet can make a challenging ventilation system much worse. Next slide, please, David. Next slide, David. Yeah, sorry, Judy. It's just um, not moving along for some reason. Um, one second. There, sorry. Okay, furthermore, wet litter is almost always a multifactorial condition. So attention must be paid to many aspects of the diet to best manage the manure. Uh, starting out as a young nutritionist, 
I became aware that when egg farmers were ringing the feed mill to order their feed, they'd say to the lass on the order desk, no salt. And to, without me knowing, the order would go over to the feed mill with no salt written on it and the guys in the mill would just not add any salt to the feed. Now, when I realised this was going on, um, I was very alarmed because at the end of the day, uh, doing something like that completely underestimates the complexity of the problem. And if someone's got a problem, you need to look at it from all angles to try and get to the bottom of it, not just take the salt out of the diet, which really can have dire consequences. Okay, so uh, next slide, please, David. So I guess what I'm focusing on is the manure as it's exiting the bird. Um, and one of the ways to determine this is to put some newspaper either on the floor of the broiler house or on the, um, the manure belt underneath the cage facility or um, in a floor-based system, maybe even on the ground in a free range situation and, and uh, see what's happening. Because there's really three things that we're interested in. Number one, has water intake increased? Has water absorption by the bird decreased? Or has urinary output increased? And then understanding each one of those three things, really trying to think about what aspects of the diet might be involved. And of course, examining the other things, the other influences, environment, disease, and water quality. I'll mention them here, but again, I'm not gonna go into detail today, just discussing those three. Next slide, please, David. Okay, so the nutritionist mission is to match nutrient intake to the nutrient requirements of the bird. Now the feed intake and the nutrient density determine the nutrient intake of the diet. So at the end of the day, when we formulate feed, it's really the nutrient density of the feed um, where you may look at a diet and say it's a 4% um, calcium diet and it's a 2,800 kilocalorie diet. That's the nutrient density of the diet. So say if there's excess nutrient intake, there will be an increase in manure moisture. And the nutrients that we're concerned that might be in excess are primarily protein or the amino acids that make up that protein and minerals. They're not the only ones, but they're the primary ones. Next slide, please. So this is uh, an example of um, how that can be turned into a precision diet so that you get a better match of nutrient intake to nutrient requirements. So the dark blue curve, um, in this case, this could be an amino acid, perhaps lysine, where the lysine level of the diet decreases as the animal gets older. And the goal of the nutritionist is to try and provide a series of diets where, where that nutrient, that intake of lysine is matched. So say, for example, this is a I think a six phase broiler feed, which would start with a, um, like a super starter diet, then a starter, a grower, finish a one, finish a two, and a withdrawal diet. Now, we don't really have that in many situations in Australia. Um, in Australia, we have to do with four diets in most situations, starter, grower, finish a withdrawal. But as you can see, um, as you change from one diet you to the next, you step down. And all we can do is try and approximate the best fit of that curve. Now say the light blue step down uh, feeding program, if that is short of the nutrient requirements of the animals, you're gonna be in a deficiency situation and growth will be limited or egg mass output will be limited in a laying hen. But say if that step down um, program is too high and it's above the dark blue curve, you're in a wastage situation. Now, I think in the past, um, nutritionists would tended to be preoccupied with making sure that you are at or above that dark blue curve. And there's certainly been situations where we're over and above that blue curve. And that um, not only costs money, um, it also is a, a problem in terms of managing litter. And I guess 
as we learn more with time, the, the objective is really to try and get those two curves on top of each other and formulate with some precision. Next curve, please, David. So still using amino acids as the example, you're probably familiar with this, uh, the classic barrel of water um, analogy to, to describe the importance of making sure all of the am limiting amino acids are met in the diet. So just to paint the picture here, protein, think of protein as being like a brick wall made up of bricks, the amino acids are the bricks. And there are several different essential amino acids that the bird can't make. It has to consume the right amount of those, of those amino acids. So say um, if lysine, for example, is deficient in the diet, then in this case, growth is limited. Growth, the analogy for growth in this barrel is water. So the barrel can't hold enough water. So if you add lysine to the diet, the barrel's capacity to hold more water is increased. Now say if you get all of those amino acids to where they need to be, you reach a point where you hit the genetic potential of the animal and they can grow no faster than that, or they can lay no more eggs than that. So that determines the height of the water once your amino acids are met. But when we're looking at things from a manure moisture perspective, I'd like to focus your attention on the boards that are sticking up too high they're in excess of requirements. So what happens to all of that excess crude protein? Next slide, please. So the problem with excess crude protein, primarily it's fermented by bacteria in the hind gut and the cecum in the large intestine. So this causes a shift to the microbial population. And there's the term dysbacteriosis, which is used to really describe an unhealthy imbalance in the bacteria in the hind gut. Um, this all results in a compromise to the integrity of the gut. Um, it can become inflamed. In really bad situations, you can end up with leaky gut where potentially um, bacteria can pass across the physical barrier of the gut into the intestines. Um, Clostridium can also cause necrotic enteritis. This interacts with coccidiosis. Um, so excess crude protein is known to cause all of that. Um, increased ammonia in the sheds because you get protein degrading by the bacteria in the sheds. And also it results in increased incidence of foot pad, dermatitis, and ultimately breast blisters. All of these things are bad. All of these things cost money. But interestingly, they're all related to an increase in manure moisture. So that's really looking at things from an intestinal perspective. But what about the kidney? Now, amino acids in excess of requirements can't be stored by the bird. They are denatured in the liver and excreted as uric acid by the kidney. That's an energy costly process, but it also requires a lot of water to flush that uric acid out through the kidney. Once again, we've increased manure moisture. So we've got a double whammy here from being in excess with crude protein. Next slide, please. So how do we decrease crude protein? Well, firstly, you've got to know your nutrient requirements and your feed intake, hence to determine the nutrient density of your diet. Um, so probably over the last uh, 20 years, we've moved towards formulating on standardised ileal digestibility of amino acids rather than total. That's certainly helped us formulate with more precision. By adding synthetic amino acids to the diets, we don't need to add as much protein meal to um, reach the amino acid requirements of the diet. Probably for many, many years now, we've been using lysine and threonine, uh, sorry, lysine and methionine. Threonine became um, a, uh, affordable probably about 15, 20 years ago. In more recent years, valine and isoleucine are now in the mix, but certainly a lot more expensive. So we use them at lower rates. And now arginine starting to become affordable. So now instead of having two limiting amino acids, potentially we can have five limiting amino acids. Um, and this is all very important to get that excess crude protein down in the diet. Um, we can also employ feed enzymes. Now all of the enzymes help with this. Um, it might not seem obvious, but carbohydrates do because they just improve the efficiency of digestion. 
phytases certainly do because amino acids can get bound to the phytic acid um, ring that we're trying to attack with the phytase enzymes. And protease enzymes improve the digestibility of the amino acids in grains and protein meals, reducing the amount of soybean in the diet. So you just end up with less, um, well, non-essential amino acids for every uh, required amount of amino, essential amino acid. Another thing that's starting to be used is single cell protein. So that's derived from yeast or blood plasma, certainly used in the pig industry in um, upfront rations in the pig industry. But we're starting to see that applied to super starter diets, perhaps a little bit too expensive to be applied more broadly than that at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so to with minerals, we must also strike for a careful balance. So you have to ensure that you meet requirements for sodium and chloride, but avoid excesses. And the best way to do this is to use both salt and sodium bicarbonate as sources of sodium, because that way with sodium bicarbonate, you get the sodium without the chloride. So that enables you to manage a maximum level of chloride in the diet, which is known to cause trouble. Um, broilers is terribly important to formulate on electrolyte balance, which is sodium plus potassium minus chloride. And we really should consider sulfur as well. Um, and that's expressed in milliequivalents per kilogram. There was some interesting work done at uh, North Carolina a few years back, where they studied the interaction between potassium and phosphorus. Mechanism's a little bit too complex to go into detail here, but suffice it to say, they found that when they increased potassium from 0.6 to 0.8% in broiler breeders, it greatly reduced manure moisture and hence the amount of manure contamination of eggs. And this flowed on to benefits in terms of less seven day mortalities and just general better chick quality as a result of better hygiene. So that, that was an interesting bit of work. Um, we certainly form on much lower calcium levels in broilers and pullets than we used to say 10, 15 years ago. And this is definitely helping with management of manure moisture. Very important um, with our SPCA systems where we're trying to have dry friable manure and low levels of um, foot pad problems. Um, also, from a layer perspective, excess calcium during the prelay period can have both short and long term effects on kidney health. Not everyone can handle the prelayer diet. It's quite tricky getting the timing right when you feed the prelayer to the birds. Uh, but there's a lot of big advantages of doing so because um, primarily a prelayer ration is about two and a half percent calcium, whereas an early lay diet is four percent calcium. So if at placement we put 17, 16 week old birds onto a, a layer diet with 4% calcium, that calcium can only go one place and that's out the kidneys, the excess calcium. So, uh, you know, there's actually some research by Brake which showed increased mortality in layers as a result of that throughout lay. And it's really interesting if you do postmortems on laying hens beyond about 70 weeks of age, some of them, their kidneys are shot and I, I, I really do believe that if we overfeed them in calcium, it, it, may, it shortens the life of the, the kidney of the hen. They, um, they can just end up with trouble later on. All of this adds up to increased manure moisture if you don't manage it correctly. Next slide. Okay, so don't try and solve a wet litter problem in layers and breeders by going to very low salt, salt levels. The big risk is cannibalism and especially true in floor-based systems. You can also compromise the long-term bone density. Um, just to quote uh, Dr. Linda Browning, she said, the calcium content of bone has been shown to be directly proportional to the sodium content of bone in an approximate 30 to one ratio, regardless of species. She thinks we've got an entire generation of old ladies in Australia who have got osteoporosis problems because they put their husbands on a low salt diet to try and solve their, um, their heart issues. It's very interesting. Um, so my advice is, you know, I usually try and stick to the manual recommendations on sodium, 
for layers and breeders, but if you're concerned about water quality and you want to go a bit low in salt, it's a bit dangerous going below 0.15. For layers, 0.165 for breeders. I have gone lower where I've got saline water, but just don't make these changes without knowing what you're dealing with. Test your water. So if litter is wet and not responding to other remedies, you can try dropping the chloride down to match sodium because normally chloride's a bit higher than sodium in the diet. And at the end of the day, you end up with a diet with not much salt and a lot of sodium bicarb. It's more expensive, but they seem to do okay on it. Now, reducing salt levels in broiler and starter and broiler grower feed is a really bad idea because you're going to limit growth. Salt is required for activation of amylase, which is the enzyme that digests starch. And we know that um, increasing the salt level in the diet is actually good for growth. Next slide. Okay, now let's change from talking about excess nutrient requirement to really the whole subject of fibre. Fibre, there's a myriad of fibres contributed by both grains and vegetable protein meals. So really, this is a big subject, but I'm just going to classify them into two groups here. We've got the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys are the fibres that are not digested by the bird, but are indeed sources of energy for the good bacteria. In other words, they're a prebiotic. Some of these fibres also absorb moisture, so you, it will actually hold the moisture in the manure and make it more friable. And um, they can also have positive effect on the size of the gizzard. I'll come back to that point shortly. The bad guys are the fibres that are not digested by the bird, but cause intestinal viscosity. So this is your classic non-starch polysaccharide coming in from grain. Um, by making the digested gummy, uh, in the end, you end up with poor general nutrient digestion and absorption. And you end up with high in gut fermentation by bad bacteria. And this all adds up to a um, imbalance dysbacteriosis situation and can increase manure moisture. Next slide. So how to manage fibres. Firstly, we must select high quality carbohydrates, enzymes to break down non-starch polysaccharide from grain to reduce intestinal viscosity and bad hindgut fermentation, xylanases and beta-glucanases. We've had these for 30 years. It's very important to get the beta-glucanase right at the moment if you're moving towards high barley diets. Um, and also don't forget the fibres in your protein meals and legumes. Think through the type of fibres that are contributed by those raw materials and consider the need for multi-enzymes that, uh, that provide say gluconase, pectinase, cellulinase and galactosidase. Because as we know, enzymes have a very specific function and you must match the enzyme to the substrate that's in the feed. Uh, in some situations, you consider the benefits of adding insoluble fibre and there are some micronized wood type products on the market that are really quite interesting. But again, I'll come back to that subject later on. Next slide. Okay, know your raw materials, test, test, test. In the absence of sufficient testing of raw materials, it's necessary to build into the specification of the diet a safety margin, or either in the raw material or the diet itself. By testing, the safety margin can be reduced, hence reducing the supply of nutrients in excess of requirements. So there is, you can get some surprises when you test, even commonly, used ingredients that have a great deal of published data can really generate some surprising data when you look at them. Um, Professor Brake put me onto this a few years ago. He said he'd done a survey of soybean meal in America and found it was highly variable in potassium. Everyone told him that wasn't the case and he proved them wrong. So I did the same thing in Australia over the course of the year and True enough, for Argentinian soya, found that there was a lot more potassium in there than the book figures, which are fairly consistent around that 2.15% level. Doesn't sound like much, but soybeans, the major source of potassium in the diet, and in some diets, it can be 30% of the diet. So it's actually very significant. Sorghum, there was a survey done um, a few years back, and Peter Sally reported that the sodium level varied by 100%. That's huge. If you've got 60% sorghum diets, that's absolutely huge and you really need to know what you're dealing with. So where there's a lack of precision, 
there is a risk of increased manure moisture. Oh, the other thing you need to know is whether or not you've got any potential mycotoxin issues and mitigate against them if possible. That can damage the gut and the kidney um, to the point where you either end up with less absorption of moisture by the gut or less resorption of water by the kidney. Next slide. Okay, coarse grinding and whole grain. This is, this is very, very important. If you increase the size of the gizzard, you can slow down the passage rate of feed to improve digestion and water absorption. And you achieve this by coarsely grinding grain in a broiler feed. You really want to grind your wheat to 800 microns. A lot of feed mills don't do that because it's harder to make pellets on a more coarsely ground grain. They like to pulverize it down to 500 microns. You're, not, you're going to get nice hard pellets, but um, you're going to get much less active gizzards. If you can supply part of the diet as whole grain, um, you know, some places are going up to 12 or even 15% whole grain in broiler diets. You've got to introduce it gradually, but you can get there. Um, and again, I'll come back to the micronized wood subject, which is particularly important in replacement pullet feeding programs. Uh, where you see similar effects on the size of the gizzard. Now, with mash layer feed, you can grind the grain quite coarse, and it doesn't matter if you've got about 10% of the grain going through whole, the birds like it. And there seems to be some behavioral advantages in doing so as well. They're less likely to display negative behaviors when they're, they're fed a coarse diet. Uh, part of it is just they pick around with the feed more and it gives them something to do. But there also seems to be a satiety effect where they're just feeling more satisfied because of that active gizzard. Next slide, please. So while we're talking about gizzards in laying hens, this is one of the big advantages of mash layer feed compared to a pelletized layer feed is the coarse grind of the grain and also the fact that there's coarse limestone in there too. So you end up with a more useful supply of calcium rather than fine calcium, which can also be in excessive requirements as well. Next slide. Now, gut health and feed additives. The aims of feed additives is to improve resilience, gut health, to disadvantage the bad bacteria and to promote good bacteria, to stimulate immunity and to reduce inflammation. This is especially important in antibody free broiler production where there is a greater risk of dysbacteriosis and hence increased manure moisture. In fact, it's critical in antibiotic free broiler production. Next slide. Rule. Do not aim to solve a dietary imbalance by mopping up the mess with feed additives. Feed additives complement good diet design. Next slide. There's a long list of feed additives and it can be quite a confusing subject for nutritionists to try and choose from the selection of products that are on offer. So just to quickly run through many of the options, um, there's essential oils, phytogenics and anti-inflammatories, organic acids, probiotics, prebiotics, mosses, uh, mycotoxin mitigators. And I've also got betaine and organic minerals there. You might think that's a bit interesting because they're both sources of nutrients. But both of those products, if you do it purely on a least cost basis, you might not include them in the diet. So we're putting them there for functional reasons. Um, in the case of betaine, it's an osmolite. So it has a direct impact on, um, on uptake of, of water from the intestine, especially important during heat stress. Also, um, there's an interaction there with coccidiosis. You have better management of coccidiosis, therefore less necrotic enteritis. So all of that adds up to less manure moisture. Organic minerals, I'll just pick out one. It's a big subject, but focus on zinc. Zinc improves villus height, uh, gut integrity. So you get much better absorption of all nutrients. So less undigested nutrient hitting the hind gut causing problems there with bad fermentation. To best select the product <clears throat> or combinations of products to apply, it's important to develop an understanding of the challenges of hand. The 
two, three, four, five different products that you might put in together depend on the situation. Next slide. So this is an example of where um, an essential oil product has had a dramatic improvement to manure moisture. So in, in the before slide, you can see a really nasty dyspacteriosis there. So in this case, it was 500 mils per thousand litres of Activo liquid in broiler breeders. And um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the fifth day, that looked like a really good result. Next slide. This trial was with Activo powder at 130 grams per tonne. That is the yellow bars on each one of those charts compared to BMD um, in starter and grower feed and Staphac in broiler finisher. So that's more of an antibiotic treatment. So that is the um, dark uh, bar on each graph uh, where a control was the light bar. So as you can see, um, a, a massive improvement in foot pad lesions here. So a lot of this goes to improving the efficiency of digestion of um, nutrients and having an impact on dysbacteriosis. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a good piece of work. Again, that's done at Auburn University, highly regarded university in America. Next slide. And this one, this is also a trial comparing um, a negative control to a positive control to a treatment with 150 grams of Activo powder in feed to 42 days. And then another treatment which looked at a lower dose of Activo to 100 grams in combination with liquid Activo that was pulsed at 12 to 14 days and then from 19 to 21 days. So what's interesting here, if you compare the third bar in each graph, um, which is the Activo powder, you can see that it's there's a very significant improvement there compared to the positive control, both in terms of feed conversion and also um, getting those necrotic enteritis lesions down. And by going to the lower dose of Activo with liquid, similar results, and um, definitely improve mortality over on the right-hand side. Next slide, please, David. So this brings me to my final slide. So really, it's just a recap on everything. And I guess at the outset, I said, the wet litter is multifactorial and that we need to consider many aspects of the diet to achieve balance, to best match nutrient intake to requirements and to address any challenges which might be affecting the birds. So um, a good nutritionist who's doing a good job, there's a lot going on when they're preparing that formula. It's, it's, it's not simply a question of plugging some specs in the computer and allowing the software to come up with a least cost formulated diet. Um, there is a fair amount of skill going on there to try and make sure uh, that these issues are being addressed. So certainly in recent years, we're setting out to reduce the crude protein level of diets and employing several strategies to do that. Carefully balancing the mineral intake, consider and manage the good and bad fibres. We must know our raw materials and we're getting more and more data on that than, than was certainly the case 30 years ago with things like NIR technology. Um, you can now do full mycotoxin screens. You can really understand the degree to which your raw materials might be oxidised and how to mitigate against that as well. That's a factor too, which I probably should have mentioned earlier. And uh, the other thing that we're doing differently than we were 20 years ago is coarse grinding grain and feeding whole grain. So again, apply gut health additives, but the secret to gut health additives is understanding your situation and what the challenges are. Because we can't spend $20 per tonne of feed on gut additives. Sometimes $3.50 is enough. And if you choose the right one, it'll make a really big difference. Um, so there's sometimes a little bit of trial and error there before you settle on the right sort of gut health uh, program but um, a very, very important piece of the puzzle. So how am I going for time, David? 
Uh, perfect. Judy, that was spot on time. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, you've definitely uh, walked us through a, a lot of different reasons for um, or where manure moisture can increase. So thanks for highlighting that to us all. Thank you, Judy. Um, so now uh, we'll move on to Byron's talk. So uh, Byron, I'll stop sharing my screen and then you can start sharing yours. So Byron Stein's our next speaker. And um, Byron is the Development Officer, Poultry Meat Intensive Livestock with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and Agriculture. And Byron's uh, talk today will be on poultry litter, the do's, the don'ts, and the might have to's. So I'll just uh, stop sharing here now. And if you could start, Byron, please. Sure, thanks, David. Uh, I'm hoping my uh, technological skills are gonna stand the test of time. Uh, okay, right, can you see that? I'm hoping you can, David. Yes, if you that, I can, Byron, All right. oh, that's great. Perfect. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Um, look, thanks everyone for uh, uh, participating um, in this webinar series and hats off to EW Nutrition and um, also to their, uh, their charity cause, uh, Prostate Cancer. So um, I was very honored to be invited to speak uh, about poultry litter and really my, the angle of my talk is very much what happens when that litter gets removed from the shed. Um, and it might then go out onto paddocks or elsewhere. But uh, this talk is very much about um, the rules, if you like, um, and some of the guidelines around poultry litter use um, once it is removed from the shed. Um, so from my personal perspective and certainly some work I've done with agronomists in Department of Primary Industries, we absolutely consider poultry manure <clears throat> spent litter, whatever you like to call it, as gold. Um, from an agronomic perspective, um, it is considered the king of animal manures, but it does have some risks. And all that really means is that, you know, you need to be aware of what those risks are and how to manage those risks. But we're very supportive and always have been um, for the, you know, the use of this very, valuable uh, byproduct. Unfortunately, our legislation terms it a waste, which I find offensive. But uh, uh, from my perspective, it's a very useful product, but does require some management um, when you are using it um, outside of sheds, either on your own farm or if you sell it to others. Um, so my work we did not that long ago, valued um, poultry litter. And so this was very much based on broiler litter, um, but we do have some numbers for layer litter as well. But from a broiler perspective, litter is really worth almost close to $100 a tonne just of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And so that's not even valuing the carbon and also the micronutrients that are in the litter. So it is, it is quite a valuable byproduct, um, but is often not nearly valued as much as it should be. And I think most growers would argue that they certainly don't get anywhere near that kind of money for their litter. Um, but it does contain quite substantial nutrients, as, as I said, is the king of animal manures um, in terms of its agronomic value. Um, but just bear in mind for those of you who may or may not know, um, so from your nitrogen perspective, just remember that you might lose up to 50% of your nitrogen. So your nitrogen might be coming out at 3.9% in the litter, but um, a substantial volume of that can be lost through volatilization um, if it's not incorporated quickly. Um, and so if you're making calculations about supplying nitrogen to a particular crop or for a particular purpose, bear in mind that you're going to lose a percentage of that nitrogen, uh, particularly if that litter hangs around for a long time. Um, so before I prattle on, uh, just a bit about me. Um, I, um, my accent may or may not have given me away, but I did a, a Master's of Agriculture and Animal and Poultry Science back in South Africa. Um, I then previously worked for Ingham's for a short stint after I arrived in Australia. 
And I've been DPI's poultry officer and then most notably poultry meat officer since 2011. So I have a colleague at Tokel College uh, who looks after the egg industry. Her name's Joanna Blunden. And my, um, my focus is principally on the poultry meat industry in New South Wales. Um, and I belong to what's called the intensive livestock unit. Uh, we also call ourselves the breakfast club sometimes because our unit really looks after your bacon, your eggs, your milk, um, your chicken schnitzel and the honey that you might be pouring over your cereal. So those are the livestock commodity units that belong to the unit I, that I'm in, chicken, meat, eggs, um, dairy and honeybees. And honeybees is kind of the, you know, the lost cousin that got thrown in with us, but we're very happy to have them. Um, I'm based in sunny Goulburn, New South Wales. The sun is inverted, well, in, in brackets because most people, ex most people's experience of Goulburn is anything but sunny, but um, it's pretty good in spring and, um, and autumn, winter and summer, not so much. Um, and I think part of the reason that David um, was interested in me doing this talk was because myself and some colleagues within DPI developed and delivered um, a third care course for poultry litter. So, and I'll talk a bit more about what third care is and why we partnered with third care, but it was very much in response to some issues that industry was having uh, around um, poultry litter, um, particularly from a, a, a um, community pushback perspective. And so there was quite some fear around litter poisoning wells and waterways and causing odor and a whole range of issues. So there was an element of environmental risk, but also a social license issue uh, in terms of poultry litter. Um, and so we stepped in to help the poultry industry develop some training and accreditation um, around the, the use of poultry litter. Um, and that was actually quite successful. And, and that, you know, helped me develop a whole range of different skills around this topic as well. So, uh, look, I'm serious. I'm essentially going to uh, cover four broad areas. Um, one is litter in the law. It sounds a bit serious, but it's not nearly as serious as it sounds. Uh, but I'm going to talk about kind of the leg the minimum legislative requirements that, you know, um, growers and processors, to be honest, should be aware of in terms of the use of spent litter. Um, also talk about some best management practices for supply, uh, and the documentation and quality assurance that goes along with that. Um, I'll also talk about residues and antimicrobial resistance issues in terms of the use of spent poultry litter. And then finally, I'll just talk about third care, which I've already alluded to, um, and the training and accreditation program that we developed and that, that is still on offer to industry if it wishes to uh, run with that program. So really, in terms of um, regulatory controls, uh, there are two principal areas uh, to focus on. One is the biosecurity, um, biosecurity legislation or biosecurity controls around the use of spent litter. And the other is the environmental and social regulations, if you like, which apply to the use of spent litter. And that's principally focused at maintaining water quality um, as well as uh, air quality or odor. Odor and, uh, is the big issue for the poultry industry and most people in the poultry industry um, know that more better than I do. But uh, the, the issue of odor and also nutrients into waterways is a big one. And as I said, biosecurity is the other issue to consider. Um, so from a biosecurity and food safety perspective, it's important to know that spent litter, whether it's raw litter, whether it's been composted, whether it's been treated in any way, will always remain what's called restricted animal material. Um, so there is a ban in Australia um, on feeding spent litter to ruminants, um, but it's, 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 it's broader than just feeding. It's also not allowing those ruminants access to stockpiles of litter, or even if you're spreading the litter on a paddock, you have to be aware that there's a withholding period before you can let ruminants back onto those paddocks. Um, 
And the principal reason for all of this is around mad cow disease or sp bovine spongiform encephalitis, uh, which is caused by a prion or a protein which um, can survive temperatures up to 500 degrees Celsius, and which is why composted litter uh, still remains restricted animal material. Um, I was quite interested when I ran the course that the, the composting industry really pushed back hard on this and were very threatened um, by the fact that compost and composted litter um, was considered restricted animal material. But the issue there is so that if you have green waste that's composted, clearly it's not considered restricted animal material, but any litter that has um, animal products or meat products, meat meal products, in them would be considered restricted animal material. And biosecurity agencies take this quite seriously. And so if uh, they drive past a paddock and they see a whole bunch of cattle or sheep or both um, in those paddocks with, um, with litter in them, then, uh, you know, they might drive in the gate and ask a few very pointed questions. Um, so it's important that if you are storing litter um, on your property um, or wherever, that uh, that litter is isolated um, from ruminants, and you know that can be simple as putting up an electrified fence and um, whatever it might be. But you have to ensure that ruminants can't actually access those litter piles. So that's probably one of the main regulations, if you like. Um, and then from a uh, also a biosecurity and food safety perspective. Um, litter has been associated with botulism and botulism outbreaks, particularly in cattle, but also sheep, um, and principally caused by Clostridium botulinum. Uh, the toxin that's produced by that um, particular pathogen is one of the most toxic known to man and certainly has and can have some quite significant impacts. And so, for example, um, there was a case of 5,000 cattle, I think, associated with a feedlot that died as a result of a clostridium outbreak and that was linked back to um, spent litter. Um, and one of the challenges with clostridium is that it's, it's, it's a spore forming bacteria. And so uh, it's quite, it can be quite resistant to composting. Um, and so even compost still, what the composted litter still has some risks um, in relation to botulism, which is why uh, the typical guidance is if you're spreading litter, whether it's composted or raw, um, that you have a 30 day withholding period between the spreading and then reallowing ruminants back into those paddocks. Um, that 30 day is not based on uh, pasteurization or um, elimination of the, the bacteria uh, so much, but it's more an agronomic number so that the you consider the pasture growing up beyond where the cattle or sheep can access that litter, um, assuming you've spread it at recommended rates, then there's a much lower chance of those animals accessing the material. Um, where growers do um, spread spent litter in, in, you know, in close proximity or on the same property as they might keep cattle, then it's um, certainly recommended that you vaccinate for clostridium um, as part of your vaccination program to give some additional um, protections um, from spent litter and, and the potential for botulism. Um, the issue has become so bad, for example, in Ireland that, um, so that's not so much the case here, but it certainly could happen, that there has been some calls for action on prohibiting or limiting the use of poultry litter because of botulism outbreaks um, in Ireland. And that's just recently. Um, and there are certainly restrictions on using spent litter in parts of Europe as well as the UK for those and other reasons. Um, and so really we want to make sure that we can continue to use litter. As I said, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of the material. Um, and so by being aware of some of these risks, we can continue to try and protect um, any poor comebacks on, on the use of litter. Um, and so, you know, and we certainly don't want to cruel the use of litter by dairy farmers or, or uh, pasturists, um, if you like, by doing the wrong thing. So, 
as long as you take some simple precautions, it shouldn't be a problem, uh, but it is important to be aware of. Um, the other issue, and this is cropping up more and more, um, is the spreading or use of litter in close proximity to production areas, and particularly production areas not associated with the farm, the materials being spreaded on or generated on. So um, if you've got a farm and a poultry farm you, and you're planning to spread litter, but your neighbor's got sheds, you know, 200 meters away, you might have to think long and hard about the biosecurity risks that you might be generating by spreading that litter um, on your paddock uh, because some of those pathogens, particularly given certain wind conditions and humidity, uh, UV index, or a whole range of different factors can certainly cause issues downwind of areas that are spreading with litter. Um, and in New South Wales, um, and I think some of the other states are slowly getting there as well. I know Queensland also have a similar principle, but in New South Wales, we have something that's called now the a general biosecurity duty. So uh, part of the rewrite of our Biosecurity Act places a lot more emphasis on uh, operators to um, take appropriate action uh, to reduce biosecurity risks to neighbours or the environment. Um, and that's essentially called your general biosecurity duty. And the failure of that would, as an example, would be spreading litter on a really windy day where the litter's kind of clearly blowing over to your neighbour who has chooks um, or even a piggery, whatever it might be. Um, that would be considered a failure of your general biosecurity duty, which might lead to prosecution or some sort of penalty. So wherever you're spreading litter, be aware of your surrounding environment, particularly in terms of other production units that might be nearby. Um, and the other issue that crops up from time to time is the use of litter in market garden situations, for example. Um, so certainly in New South Wales, um, particularly up on the central coast and in Western Sydney, um, manure, uh, spent litter, poultry manure is highly sought after for um, by market gardeners, um, particularly for vegetable and also for fruit production purposes. Um, but you need to be aware that there are some restrictions that apply in terms of applying either raw manure or even composted manure um, in terms of the time frame to harvest. So uh, the, the current fresh care um, guidelines, and this isn't a statutory um, law or regulation, if you like, but uh, I would suggest people consider it because, again, this would point to a general biosecurity duty. But if you're going to be harvesting certain crops, um, then you certainly don't want to be applying this material within 45 days of harvest or 90 days of harvest. Um, and the reason for the 45 and 90 is because some plants are eaten raw um, and are grown close to the ground. And in that case, you would use a 90 day um, separation period, if you like, between application and harvest. Um, and for other products that are cooked, or that have some sort of pathogen reduction step prior to um, being consumed, then 45 days is enough. But if you go to the fresh care guidelines, just tap, uh, type them into your favorite browser, you'll find um, the specific guidelines that apply to specific crops. Um, but I found that quite a few of the market gardeners weren't aware of some of these um, uh, these timelines. Um, and as a result, um, some of you might remember that there was a huge um, salmonella outbreak in Victoria associated with salad that had to be withdrawn from um, supermarket shelves. Um, and that was linked to, evidently, linked to salmonella. And the finger was squarely, well and squarely pointed at the poultry industry. Now, whether the the poultry industry was in fact responsible, or whether it was poultry manure, not so much the industry, but certainly poultry manure was the source of the infection. Um, I'm not sure, it, it certainly may have been, but that certainly was the perception um, at the time. And so ensuring you know, that you're applying the stuff and not applying pathogens to products that people are gonna be consuming is incredibly important. 
So, so that's the biosecurity side kind of dealt with. In terms of environmental and social laws and restrictions, and again, my focus is on New South Wales, so apologies to those of you in other states, but I suspect that your environmental laws will be very, very similar. Um, but essentially, boiling it down to, uh, you know, the key issues is whatever you do with your litter, uh, make sure that you're not going to either pollute land or waters or potentially pollute land or waters. You don't actually have to have caused pollution under the most of the environmental legislation. There just has to be a, a likelihood or a risk of you having done so, which might lead to a prosecution. Um, and the reason I've included this specific image in the slide is because this is a real life situation where a, uh, a contractor dumped a huge pile of poultry litter and it's not easily seen, but there's an ephemeral stream right next to the stockpile. So it's not running at the moment, but as soon as that part of the world gets a good rainfall, that stream will be flowing. And no doubt that nitrogen and phosphorus and pathogens that are sitting there in that stockpile will enter that water course and then bang, that's absolutely an infringement of um, environmental legislation irrespective of what state or territory you're in. Uh, the other issue of course is around offensive odours and this one really is quite tricky uh, because whether you like it or not and irrespective of what you do to it, litter ult uh, ultimately will have an odour, not necessarily for a long period of time, but certainly can be odorous. Um, and the bulk of complaints that we get and, and local governments get around the use of spent litter is absolutely around odour. Um, but again, there are some things that growers or others can do um, to avoid some of those issues. And then lastly, uh, some growers or, or poultry farm operators are not aware of some of the restrictions that are imposed on them by their development consent conditions. So I've had instances where farms have been spreading litter for years, um, only to eventually be prosecuted by a local government because they've pointed out that that was not permitted under their development consent conditions, much to their um, disgust, but also to their ignorance. Um, and so whether you have a farm or it could be a breeder farm, if it's a company farm, just make sure you're aware of whatever your consent conditions are, because they can be highly varied, sometimes quite confusing, um, but they can be enforced. Uh, and so make sure that if you are spreading litter, you're not prohibited from doing so by your development consent condition, uh, and then that would apply in whatever state you might be in. So some examples of, you know, smart things and dumb things to do in terms of spreading litter um, would be to ensure that if you are spreading litter, try and avoid or absolutely avoid spreading within 10 metres of a water course. Um, that's just a rule of thumb. That 10 metres can extend to 30 metres or 40 metres if you've got a significant slope. Um, and if you look at the bottom left-hand picture, if you're spreading litter to that paddock, um, there's no, uh, no grass, no crops, no ground cover to capture that, that material before it ends up in a creek. So you certainly wouldn't want to be applying it to that kind of land. I'm surprised that land's even been worked because of the slope. Um, so you wouldn't be applying material to that kind of land if you can help it. Um, on the top right hand corner, there's a drainage line. So it's not a creek so much, but a drainage feature within the landscape. Um, and if you're spreading litter and you're spreading litter into that drainage feature, you're absolutely going to end up with nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and pathogens downstream into a creek or a storage facility, whatever it might be. So just thinking about the drainage features in the, in the landscape and avoiding those in terms of uh, litter application can go a long way in preventing um, water pollution issues. Um, the picture down the bottom right-hand side is almost a demonstration of having to wait for rain, heavy rainfall to fall to figure out sometimes where these drainage depressions are. So would, I would never have guessed there was a drainage depression in that particular paddock at that place until we had some heavy rainfall. And then it's kind of clear as day. 
um, where you can see where water will flow. And so being aware of those features in the landscape when you're spreading litter, when contractors are spreading litter is really important to make sure that you're keeping all the useful stuff that you're paying for um, or that is valued um, on the paddock and not in your neighbor's dam or in Sydney's drinking water catchment or Adelaide's drinking water catchment or wherever it might be. So odour is a big ticket item from um, using litter perspective um, and it probably generates the bulk of complaints. Um, and the, the legislation around this is not as cut and dried as people might think. Um, and I'll get to that in, in a second slide. But essentially, the things that growers can do or anyone applying this material can do, including contractors, would be thinking about the timing of application. Um, and so, you know, thinking about whether you're doing it in the morning or the evening, uh, the suggestion would be do it early in the morning if you can, waiting for the day to heat up and you're going to get some dispersion. But if you're applying the stuff late at night and you're going to get cold air conditions and then therefore catabatic drift or cold air drainage, um, that's when you get a lot of complaints. So if you can do it where you can get as much of that odour dispersed as the day warms up as possible, that's helpful. Um, try to avoid spreading on weekends if you can, uh, particularly in peri-urban situations that when we have plenty of those in New South Wales. Um, weekends is just a, a, a very difficult situation because most of your Pitt Street farmers or, you know, uh, hobby farmers, um, farmers or neighbours that, you know, live in the city but um, go to the country for their two or three day, day weekend, don't take kindly to the smells generated by this material on weekends. So this obviously all depends on how constrained your site is. So if, you know, if you've got close neighbours or you're in a semi-rural or peri-urban interface, then you you just have to be smart about how you use this material to avoid issues. Um, thinking about wind direction, um, advising neighbours, um, and it, a lot of people undervalue that, but um, the work we did up in kind of northern New South Wales around advice to neighbours went a hell of a long way. So where growers actually just went to neighbours and said, look, I'm going to be spreading litter next week. I'm sorry about the smell. It'll probably only last a couple of days. Just want to make you aware of that. Um, irrespective of your relationship with your neighbours, even if you put a note into your post box, um, that seemed to keep council off growers' backs um, a significant degree. And if growers had advised neighbours um, and, and then council got a complaint, because those growers had advised the neighbours, council took a very sympathetic um, position uh, in relation to the spreading of the litter, but where neighbours weren't advised, regulators, for example, councils, even the EPA seem to come down a lot harder. So if you can demonstrate you're doing everything you can to, re to reduce impacts, that really does go a long way. And then avoiding spreading litter straight up onto your boundary where it's close to a sensitive receptor, for example. Um, the reason I have a picture of the, the wedding, which has been disrupted by a dust storm, is that there have been instances where, you know, a grower's decided to spread litter on weekend and the neighbours have decided to have a wedding at the same time and the two simply just don't mix. And so by talking with one another, you can avoid those situations where, um, you know, uh, a relatively innocent um, activity like spreading litter can have significant consequences uh, in terms of your neighbours and then once they get upset, councils or the EPA will be on your back, no doubt. Um, just in terms of, uh, so POEO, sorry for the acronym, stands for Protection of Environment Operations Act in New South Wales. And again, I think the, the environmental legislation in the other jurisdictions is very similar. Certainly the principles are the same. But the key issue here is to know that it's not simply uh, the odour offence that's been caused, but it's uh, most of the legislation talks about the failure to maintain or operate equipment or deal with materials in a proper and efficient manner. So if you've, if you've done everything by the book, you've advised your neighbours, you've checked your wind conditions, um, you've logged where you're going to do it, um, you've really followed every 
best management practice known to man, and there is still an odour impact on neighbours, um, you will have quite a significant defence um, if you can demonstrate that you've gone through that those processes. But if you can't, and if you you know if you fail to maintain or operate equipment, or deal with materials, or show some regard to um, reducing impacts, well then you, know, you have a much greater chance of losing uh, uh, to a council or, or, or in court or to the EPA. So the key message here is to take all practical means to minimise and prevent air pollution and just as importantly to document what you've done. Um, I've seen it over and over again, smart growers will do everything by the book but also have the evidence that they've done so um, and they tend to be um, dealt with far more sympathetically by regulators than um, operators who, who can't be bothered. Um, if I had to sum up this whole talk in two words, and some of you might have wished that I had, um, I would say that you really need to warn and inform. And you, I'll get to who exactly you is in a second, but whoever the supplier of that litter material is, including everyone else along the supply chain, including the final recipient, um, should be warned or you should warn and inform everyone along that supply chain of the benefits of litter, but also some of the risks, some of the legal obligations um, and some of the guidelines that, are, that apply to the material. Because up until now, litter has been uh, treated quite kindly by the regulatory system. Um, there haven't been uh, enforcement of labeling, for example, um, you can still spread raw manure despite some of the pathogen risks that may or may not come with that material. Um, and the regulations really have been slow to catch up um, and start clamping down on poultry manure. And to, to be honest, I'm hoping it remains that way because as I said, it's a product we like um, and certainly don't want to cause any issues for growers having to get rid of this material and take it from a byproduct to um, a significant waste management problem, uh, that would be the last thing we would want. But to ensure that doesn't happen, I would urge companies and growers to think about warning and informing anyone who removes that material, as well as everyone downstream, um, be that the contractor, um, any middleman, and, and then fi the final user. Uh, has to be warned and informed of what they're getting, what their obligations are and what some of the risks are. If you haven't done that, I think you're opening yourself to litigation and even potential prosecution. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a second. Byron? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, you have about five minutes left. Oh, all right, good. I'm, I'm, I'm almost Sorry. there. No, no I'm worries. glad you I, I'm glad you have. Uh, I could talk underwater with a mouthful of marbles. Um, so just quickly, do you need to label uh, litter? That's been asked, especially in New South Wales with the change of our regulations. The good news is that you don't. So none of the uh, trigger levels for cadmium, lead or mercury are triggered by litter. Um, so you don't need to label litter because the cadmium, uh, lead and mercury levels are below particular trigger levels, but Having said that, there are some there are some heavy metal limits which, particularly broiler litter, um, gets quite close to, and in particular um, zinc. So at the moment, um, the guidelines for for zinc are 300 milligrams per kilogram or parts per million, and as you can see in this table, some of the broiler litter samples that we've looked at. Um, are above those numbers. For everything else, our numbers are, uh, are lower and that's good news. So from a heavy metal perspective, every other of the heavy metals is safe, but zinc is kind of marginal. So you might have to do some testing to make sure your materials are below those numbers. And if they are higher than those numbers, there might be some restrictions on how that material could be used. Um, so just very quickly, uh, bearing in time, uh, that, that probably got three minutes now, um, in terms of litter supply, you might have a growers, a loader driver, transport driver, contractor, and then an end user all involved in the supply chain. Unless 
you have warned and informed everyone downstream of that supply chain about the limitations of the litter. So we know that it's not a perfectly balanced fertilizer, so you should never claim that it is, um, that there are some risks associated with it and there are some regulations associated with it. If you haven't warned and told people that, you certainly might be opening yourself up to litigation. Um, and so we strongly recommend that growers or suppliers of litter provide a supply agreement um, to anyone taking that stuff and then downstream of that material. We've developed an agreement. Um, that's just a, a, a small snapshot of it, um, but it's quite comprehensive and deals with all the regulations in New South Wales, but certainly be adapted for the other states. If anyone wants a copy, please get a hold of me. Happy to send out as many as you like. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to speed up. So I'm going to skip through those. These are just some examples of lawsuits. Um, that were applied to um, suppliers of litter because of some of those issues I've raised. And then also there's some issues around litter falling and spreading onto roads and people copping fines for eff animal effluent ending up on roads um, in New South Wales. And I'm assuming the same applies to the other states. Just very quickly in terms of uh, residues and antimicrobial resistance, from a, a manure perspective, there currently isn't there aren't any specific regulations. So this is being managed very much um, at the prescription end or at the veterinary end in terms of the birds in the sheds. There are no specific residue restrictions, particularly from antimicrobials that I'm aware of, certainly in New South Wales, in terms of manure. Um, those restrictions essentially apply to the heavy metals. And this is partly because of the, the national residue survey testing that's, that's done quite um, uh, regularly, um, but it, AMR might still be an issue that's on the horizon. So just briefly, it's really those heavy metals that you need to be thinking about in your litter, which could cause grief. And then very lastly, uh, David, sorry for the time I told you, you should, I, I kind of warned you I'd go on and on. Um, third care is um, the inorganic fertilizer industry's kind of social license package where they delivered training quality assurance certification and accreditation to the fertilizer industry in response to um, some concerns about the fertilizer industry poisoning the earth and the soil, um, which is far from the case, but you know, there certainly have been some instances. And so that the industry came up with a third care package. We partnered with third care um, to deliver a package specifically for poultry manure. Um, and that package really drives uh, training in terms of making sure that you're providing the right source of fertilizer at the right rate at the right time and in the right place. And that's really the focus of the, of the food care package that we deliver. Um, very quickly, uh, whether you might have to compost litter in the future, we don't know. There's certainly been talk of it. Whether you might have to analyze every batch, we hope not, but that could come, uh, that could come about. Whether you have to soil test, we suggest you probably will if you're applying. And whether you know government's going to force uh, the industry to become accredited if it wants to supply and use the material well, uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I think that the environmental protection agencies across the various states are having a closer look at litter than they have for a very long time. So there might be some changes coming our way. Uh, and to take home, warn and inform your um, your clients to make sure you protect your business and your industry. So thank you very much and apologies for going over time. Thanks, Byron. That's uh, very good information. And uh, as you say, forewarned is forearmed. And uh, yeah, uh, good things to think about um, for what we're doing right now and, and possibly in the future. So I'll just um, shop, stop sharing your screen and we will now go into our Q&A session. So, and that's the, the address down there is the website, I mean, sorry, the email address that you can send um, questions to as well, if you think of any after the webinar over the next few days as well, and um, we can get back to you. So uh, we'll look at, uh, I think there was a couple of questions there for yourself, Judy. Um, there's one there from Lynn Fisher, which is, are products like OptiCell and ArborCell that you're referring to as micronized wood? Oh, yeah, the answer to, to that, I think, 
that's exactly what I mean. Um, so there's a few different products on the market. There's uh, OptiCell, which is JRS. Um, sorry, Arbacel is JRS. OptiCell, um, I think BEC have. A bit of a difference between the two. I think the JRS one is more of wood, whereas the other one's got a little bit of bark in it. So if you line the two of them up, they, they are slightly different in their capacity to absorb water. Um, Arbacel absorbs a bit more water, but it's also a bit more expensive. So say in a pullet feed, depending on your size of batch in your feed mill, um, you know, you can chuck a bag in per batch of feed. That might be somewhere between half a kilo hang on, I'm getting my maths wrong here, five kilos and 10 kilos per tonne of feed. So the aim is that when you're formulating the feed, you're trying to get the pullet feed up to over 5% fibre. And that's going to depend on the other ingredients that you've got in your feed. You might have barley, you might have mill run, you might have oat hulls. Um, all of those things you're taking into account to try and get that fibre level up. But yeah, there's some real benefits there in terms of getting a, a bigger gizzard size. And it, it, it means that when your layer hits the early late period, they have a greater capacity to consume feed, which is a good thing at that time when they often struggle to eat enough feed. So um, primarily my reason for doing that is to address that, but you're going to have whole of life benefits because you've got an animal with a bigger gizzard and it's going to have a slower passage of rate of feed through the gut and better water absorption characteristics. Now, I have heard that um, gizzards are a bit like any muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it. So say if you hit them with a low fibre diet at point of lay that might be less than 3% fibre, you're going to lose some of the benefit that you've invested in during pullet rearing. Thanks, Judy. And there's another one there for you from Michelle. And uh, it's He's asking, did I miss something about the micronized wood on pullets? Can you please explain more on that? Yeah, so I guess I guess that may be relating to the same thing. So um, yeah. Thanks. And so I think there was one there for yourself, Nalini, earlier on about whether you had done any testing of ammonia levels. In, no, in any of the no. research you did? No, we didn't test for ammonia levels. We just tested for pH, but when we were composting the piles, or I shouldn't use the word composting, but when they were piled up and we were testing them, there was a huge amount of ammonia. We could just breathe them. We couldn't uh, get closer to the shed at that time because, uh, yeah, and that's probably contributory to pathogen die off the ammonia, but we didn't test the levels, no. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a question here from Sa Sam Barud. Um, he's asking, uh, how important is it to clean and sanitize the shed if you are intending on reusing old litter? Okay, that happens anyway. That happens anyway. So what happens is the piles created at the grow out end of the shed for about three to four days. And while the piles there, the farmers clean and sanitize the shed anyway. They don't, they try not to wet the pile, but that happens anyway. Everything else that happens in conventional farming happens anyway. So it's the perception and that's why we largely did that work because there's this big perception that reuse litter has problems and you know, it's gonna bring in salmonella and campylobacter. But what I was trying to show is that the dominant salmonella for example comes with the flock more than what's in litter. No sooner the flock are there, the litter has appreciable levels. But sanitation occurs anyway. Everything else, it's company practice and they have their protocols. So, and the other thing was all our trials were done during normal commercial farming uh, on most of them were reused farms. So it was not like they were set up specially to be done. They were done part of their normal practice. And our studies were designed in a manner that we wouldn't change anything they were doing, just go with what they did and try to understand. So even the three shed trial where we had that one year per shed, everything as per a commercial farming cycle occurred. And that was the beauty in us 
you know, working with the real conditions. So that happened yeah. anyway. Okay, thank you. And we have a question here from Lynn Fisher uh, for you, Nalini. Um, she's asking, is there any products that can be sprayed onto bedding to reduce the incidence of Salmonella and Campylobacter? Again, there's no problem. Why would you need to spray something onto bedding? Because generally, when you look at it, um, the pileup process contributes to die off, right? I showed that with salmon and lacampylobacter doesn't even hang around. It dies off very quickly. You don't want to add another variable into the farming system unless you really, really have to. You don't need to. So the way the reuse happens is the pileup process contributes a lot. One farmer pile, the other farmer, his normal practice was just to keep it. Irrespective of that, uh, campylobacter was not transferred to transmitted to the next cycle. Litter remained negative until the chickens came on and until the colonization happened in the chicken, that is mid cycle for campylobacter. In terms of salmonella, by large, the higher numbers, and that's why we quantified, we didn't just do presence or absence, we quantified, by large, the higher levels come with the flock if the flock is having salmonella positive. So why would you do that? You know, you wouldn't need to add that variable. And a lot of this work was done to create that understanding. We did it new, during normal farming. We had to create this understanding that reuse litter is not something that is bringing some big variable in the end. Because in the end, when you look at it, there was no difference to the end product in either terms of litter or the sika. What happens with the chicken is much more dominant. There needs to be an understanding with Campylobacter colonization because um, Campylobacter is a, still a problem. Uh, it colonizes mid-cycle. Generally, thin out is sort of thought as a reason. But as I showed you in the trials that occurred accidentally, we had three different litter practices. So to control Campylobacter, you need to understand colonization. Salmonella is different. If you can manage, say, having a flock without salmonella, that's fine. But sometimes we see Sophia dominating. I didn't put up all that data. But Sophia also can sort of uh, colonize into appreciable levels if it's there. But Sophia sometimes turns up and doesn't turn up at times. So, no, I don't think you need to spray things to litter. Plus, the birds eat litter. And we've heard a lot about uh, gut health and stuff like that, you know, you, and the gut microbiome is important in um, how the pathogens colonize and other things, you know, you don't want to add more things to a system. You know, it's, it should be taken as a holistic system where everything is taken into consideration. I don't think you need to spray litter. As Byron said, it's a valuable product. I mean, reusing is great if you can reuse it and have the same outcome as conventional farming. And that's what we've seen right along through those series of trials we carried out involving litter first, litter and the bird. Um, yeah, I think reusing is great if you can manage to do it within the holistic approach of all the other entities like ventilation and other things. Okay, yes, Lynn's reply. She said, thank you. That is what I was thinking. If the litter was treated to, to help when the birds ingested the litter. Oh, I don't think you need to treat. What would you treat litter for? You know, litter, once it was piled up, you know, you saw the die off of both organisms or when it was spread. And then it went through the cycle performing exactly as new bedding did in terms of the end products. The physical parameters were generally the same, the pHs, the temperatures, and you could see, you no know, sooner you place the chickens, and if it was a salmonella positive flock, you would see that, and Campylobacter colonized as it would do normal um, full clean out bedding. So I think we have to get away from this perception that there is a problem with reuse litter. We have to do this and we have to do that. Just I uh, think, look at Queensland. They have been using this for 20, 30 years. And uh, I think that's why we had to put the science behind it. 
And of course, there are certain things, like I said to you, there's certain key things. Okay, we need to make sure that there is die off, but how each farmer does it was slightly different, but in the end, we achieved the same end result. So pathogens, both pathogens probably, excepting for salmonella regrowth that could occur if the conditions were conducive, like 30 to 35 degrees, were in later. But then once you put the chickens, what comes there is much higher. And that's what I was showing. And sometimes you could find a residue in that new shed with the new bedding as well. But that was low as well in terms of salmonella. Campylobacter batter really, there was no problem in, in comparing the three litter practices. Campylobacter batter is a problem, but comparing the three litter practices, there was no uh, differences. So, uh, you know, my focus in this talk was reuse litter. Okay, that's great. I think Lynn's saying, okay, thank you. That's, that's a very good uh, answer. Uh, Nalini. So, um, okay, and there are no other questions there. So, um, hey Dave, hey. could I jump in with a question? Uh, yeah, me too. Okay. Yes. Looks like we can't type questions in, so um, the only way I can do it is by voice. Yeah, we have the mics. Yes. <laughs> now, I've got I've got one for Debbie there because um, the thrust of both our presentations was how to get manure moisture down, but when we're in antibiotic two antibiotic-free situations where we can't even use anti-coccidials and we're vaccinating for um, coccidiosis, you can actually get manure too dry. And I'm wondering what your comment is in that situation to make sure we have um, proper cycling of coxie. Yeah, you're right, um, Judy. We do need to, um, when we're vaccinating with for coxie, we do need to pay a lot of attention to our humidity and, and moisture in the floor for that cycling in those very first seven to 10 days. Um, so generally, because this is something we do in, in the parent stock generation, they vaccinate for um, coxie. So it's about adding moisture to the floor initially to make sure that cycle is happening, that our assist are, are, are cycling through so that you are getting that, that build up in the, in the system. Um, so what they will do is they'll tend to, you can either just lightly mist the floor, the, the shavings, where the, particularly when you're starting to open up and you're letting your birds across into the, to the area where there's been no droppings. You can drag droppings across, you can add a little bit of moisture by just spraying a fine mist with a garden um, backpack sprayer. Just so, it, like you said, just so it helps that irises cycle so that they are getting that immunity going forward. Okay, and you had a question too, Byron? Yeah, thanks, David. My question was to Nalini. Um, I've read the work that uh, Pat, Pat Blackall did and you did uh, in relation to, you know, say, bioaerosols from sheds and also yeah. reuse of litter. And I'm interested in, I was certainly interested in your comments around salmonella during your talk. Um, but is one of the reasons that salmonella, has, salmonella hasn't been a particular challenge is because we've been dealing with um, non-zoonotic versions of salmonella, say, so where it's not, a, 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 there's no risk to humans, whereas now we have Enteridotus in New South Wales and in Victoria, um, and I know you've had issues with Typhimurium in Queensland. Does that change uh, the balance in any way? No, essentially what was happening was as I've shown you today, the levels of salmonella in litter were around 10 to the five, much lower, or 10 to the four. So if you, I have those two papers, I don't know whether you read my publications, but in that I have shown it that the levels that we captured in litter were in aerosols were much, much lower. So there was a litter aerosol relationship and I demonstrated that with E. coli. In terms of Campylobacter, the levels in litter were quite high, higher, 10 to the six, 10 to the seven at the time we did those studies but it just dies off quickly. So it comes down to a numbers game, not a Cirava thing. Salmonella generally is a good survivor. We even did dust, I just showed you that today. So it comes down, if Salmonella doesn't reach that high levels in litter, it reaches about 10 to the five, 10 to the six, something like that, if I can remember those studies. So it comes down to the litter aerosol numbers. So it's nothing to do with the Cirovas. Any Cirova would survive. 
if the num say like if you go for some reason pumping out 10 to the 8 CFU per gram of uh, which had a concentration of 10 to the 8 CFU per gram and that was what E. coli was you were seeing E. coli I can't remember the numbers but appreciable levels higher than salmonella but salmonella doesn't reach that height in litter um, mm -hmm. Campylobacter does but the on the flip side it dies off quickly and we only ever mm -hmm. capture it once in the 52 times we sampled so yeah it's the way to think about that is salmonella in the chicken gut the levels are much lower than what campylobacter would reach in the chicken gut it's about 10 to the 4 campylobacter is about 10 to the 8 to 9 so if you were to have aerosols generated from that from tunnel ventilated sheds i think we captured it twice inside and once outside at a low level the numbers are too low to go out and be of any concern in terms of campylobacter true the levels in litter are high but it just dies off very quickly. There's a poor survival. And it's the same in litter as well. And most of the time, once the chickens are removed, Campylobacter starts dying very quickly, probably not Salmonella. So yeah, it's if there was any serovi, it would do the same thing. But it's not serovi uh, dependent. It's numbers dependent, sure. levels. And that was the focus of our trials rather than doing positive, negative, was to quantify, so to, to, to show you where the risks were, where the problems were. And that puts a perspective into the work. And sure. right through, and one, yeah. one last question, Alini, sorry. W what's the view of reuse in terms of endemic diseases like, say, ILT? So would you still use reused litter and, and semi-pasteurize it if you had a shed with birds with uh, infectious not, laryngeal <laughs> tracheitis? On my scope, I'm a food microbiologist. Uh, and yeah. I could talk to Salmonella and Campylobacter, but you know, that's something I can't comment on. That's not my expertise. Yeah. I mean, I can't see the processes supporting that, but I was curious whether, you know, consideration of some of these other issues around ILT, for example, um, would factor, but I, I think I can hazard a guess. But what you have to see, Byron, is Queensland has been reusing litter for a long time. And, you know, there have been no major pro I don't know about ILT, but that's not been a barrier. Things have not been a barrier. It is a resource. Bedding's getting scarce, right? Mm. And, you know, pine shavings are a problem. It's not only pine shavings. When I was working with Margaret, one of the things she would tell me, it's also getting the quality pine shavings for the mm. sheds. And 10 years ago, she would say to me, in 10 years time, we're going to have problems. We need to have this data. We need to have all this to support the regulators who may come and say, oops, this is the problem with reuse later. This is the problem. This is the problem food safety. We need to have all this backup data. And that's the reason this thing was done. So you have to take things in context. It's, uh, as I said to you in one of my comments finally, is that we could provide the science as scientists as to what happens, but it's also a practical business. So whatever happens has to be merged in with what the farmers can do. You know, you, it's a bit problematic. And that's where I am very sort of keen that, that the regulators understand a lot of what's happening on farm. Because sometimes, you know, they think, I had to present, give this presentation and the regulators were really happy to understand that, okay, this is the situation. Otherwise they look, okay, reuse litter. We need to be testing for Campylobacter. We need to be testing for Salmonella. You know, that was not the case. It, reuse litter was not showing any difference in terms of the end product. It behaved like the rest of the litter practices. So I think it's important that we spread the word and, you know, spread the science so people understand this because reusing probably it may become inevitable in the future. It's always yeah. an environmental issue as you've seen stockpiling mm. litter and things like that. Mm. No, I, think, I agree. Uh, yeah. And I it looks like it's heading that way already. Yeah, I think we, that it has to go. I mean, it will go that way because was it you or somebody, Debbie, or somebody said pine shavings. Pine shavings are the preferred source. And I think that will remain that way in Australia and New Zealand. And if that's going to be the source, I think we have to spread the word and, you know, put the science behind it uh, to the regulators and probably help to address that because chicken farming has to go on. Mm. 
and there Thank shouldn't you. be barriers from regulators or other people because uh, we've done it in Queensland for so long. So I think it's important from a cost perspective as well. I can send you those aerosol papers, Byron, if you haven't read them. <laughs> no, I'll okay. send you an email. Thank you. Yep, send me an email. <laughs> All right, thanks guys. Um, yeah, so we've unfortunately run out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today and uh, thank you to everyone for attending as well. We had uh, 45 um, attendees. So EW Nutrition will be donating $2,250 to the Prostate Cancer Foundation. So that's a great result. That's about half of what um, the golf day would do. So it's really great. Um, really good to see that still happening. So um, thank you all. I'll, I'll, I, I'll, and thank you, Yurik and Zach for helping as well. And all our speakers again, very good. And I'll launch the poll now and um, yeah, we will um, hopefully catch up with you all in the future. Bye. <laughs>